Royal Commission is now resumed. Good morning, everybody. Um, we commence this final day of uh, the hearing this week with uh, the acknowledgement of country. I wish to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Iora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land upon which uh, Commissioner Ryan and I are located. I also uh, acknowledge the Turbul and Jagera Nations upon whose lands our hearing room in Brisbane is located. And of course, uh, Commissioner Atkinson is there and the uh, Wawarundari people of the Kulin Nation upon whose lands uh, Commissioner Gelbally is presently located. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations people who are viewing this hearing on the live stream. Uh, yes, Ms Eastman. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, and good morning to everyone following the uh, webcast for the final day of public hearing nine. Our first witness this morning is the Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Dr. Ben Gauntlet. Yes, good morning, Dr. Gauntlet. Thank you very much for coming to give your evidence today. Um, I'm sure you're aware, but just in case you're not in on the screen, you have Commissioner Atkinson, who is in our Brisbane hearing room. Commissioner Galbally is in Melbourne. And of course, Commissioner Ryan is uh, in the Sydney hearing with room with me, as indeed you are. Uh, I will ask my associate to uh, administer the oath to you, if you would be good enough to follow her instructions. Thank you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gauntlet. Uh, Ms. Eastman will ask Thank you. you some just before I start, um, just for the people participating in the Sydney hearing room, our Auslan interpreters are based in the Brisbane hearing room. And sometimes there's an occasion where, gentlemen, you're all very softly spoken. And so <coughs> I may need you to keep your voices up so the Auslan interpreters are able to, uh, to do their job. With that, Dr. Gauntlet, can I confirm that you are Dr. Benjamin Gauntlet? Uh, it's just Ben, just actually. Ben. Right. So Ben <laughs> Gauntlet, and you are the Disability Discrimination Commissioner. I am. And you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission dated 3 December. Are the contents of that statement true? Yes, they are. Right. Now, Commissioners, you have a copy of the statement, which is in Tender Bundle A at tab 40. And if you could receive that into evidence and mark it exhibit 9.24. Yes, that can be done. And there are a number of annexes and documents accompanying the statement at night, if they could be marked 9.24.1 through to 9.24.5. Yes, that also can be done. Right. Now, Dr. Gauntlet, before coming to your work as the Disability Discrimination Commissioner, uh, You've spoken about your lived experience as a person with disability in your statement, and you've said, as the commissioner, it's important to be open about your lived experience of disability so other people with disability also feel comfortable sharing their experiences and can consider and reflect on your own experiences. So normally people ask you about your job and what you're doing and what the policies might be, but I'd like to start if you're agreeable with telling the Royal Commissioners about your lived experience with disability, starting from when you were a teenager. Uh, certainly. Uh, I accept that for some people with disability, the disclosure of their disability is a challenging issue. But I feel as Disability Discrimination Commissioner, it is important to be open and transparent so that people can learn from my individual circumstances. I had a spinal cord injury when I was playing rugby, aged 16. It was a Monday night. I had the choice whether to go to athletics training or to replay a rugby match that, that we'd won three weeks beforehand against one of our rival schools. I decided to go to the rugby match. The umpire didn't turn up, but a coach decided to referee the game. Towards the end of the first half, when I was, I ran after someone to tackle them. I tackled them. 
I then tackled another person and as I was getting off the ground, my teammate fell on my head and I heard a, a, a large cracking sound and then I remained on the ground, unable to get up or take my mouth gut out. What that led to was a circumstance where I became a, what's called a complete cervical lesion six tetraplegic as a result of a bifacetal dislocation of my neck. That means that I have an inability or compromised use of my hands, my arms, my legs, my ability to regulate temperature, sense, sensation and bodily functions. It has been a significant life change for myself, but also for my family and loved ones. And it means that I am a participant on the National Disability Insurance Scheme and before that was a participant on state-based insurance schemes because my accident was non-compensable in nature. But I was lucky at the time that my school did raise some money for my parents to modify their house to enable me to return home to complete my schooling. Uh, I accept that for some people, when viewing this, they may regard the circumstances of my accident as irrelevant or um, not needed to be discussed. But I think it is important for young people in particular with disability or people who have recently acquired a disability to understand that disability is diverse and different and it affects every single person differently. And so whilst it is diverse and different, we can learn a lot from considering how others have approached issues. And this is why when we look at issues such as employment, we need to undertake policies where we work with people with disability, not for people with disability. I want to ask you about some of those policies later on, but can I bring you back? Sure. So after the accident, you were 16, so you still had a few years of school to go. So what changed in terms of school and your expectation of what life might be after school? I think uh, you probably just go into an instinct where I just wanted to finish school. And I just hoped for the best in finishing school. And I wanted to finish school with my friends. And you literally just take it day by day and go to class and hope that you will do the best that you can. Uh, I was uh, particularly fortunate to have a, a very good support structure around me to enable me to finish school. Uh, I used to play an incredible amount of sport. Not playing sport meant I had a lot more free time on my hands to study and to pass, to pass exams, et cetera. But what I felt or what I tried to do was to try and just achieve that simple goal of finishing school. You did very well at school, didn't you? I did do reasonably well at school. Uh, and I accept that I, I have always come from a reasonably scholastic background. Uh, so why after school did you think, well, my next step is to start to study medicine in Perth? I always wanted to be a doctor. And I thought to myself, why not become a doctor? It's all I've wanted to be. And I always was told, just do what you, just do what you want to do. Um, my parents have been very supportive of me and in particular my mother and she would always say to you is, do not let your disability define you. You can live your own life. It's your path. You can try to live the path that's good for you. And I thought to myself, well, I've always wanted to be a doctor. Um, why not try and be a doctor? So you started medicine. So, so I started well, medicine. We now know the story down the track that you're a lawyer. So what happened with medicine and uh, how did you come to the journey of the law? Well, I guess uh, I did first year medicine along with everyone else, but it gradually became apparent to me that during anatomy class, I couldn't see the bodies. And also I couldn't, uh, I was struggling to get to class on time to get personal assistance to enable me to attend the classes I wanted to. And so 
when I was in second year, I thought I needed to change to a career that I knew I could do. And the course and career which had the lowest number of contact hours, which I still thought was quite a useful career, was law. <laughs> So, not, so you didn't really come with this burning passion to be a lawyer. Are you telling us that? I think it would be fair to say I, I didn't have a burning passion to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a doctor. But sometimes it's a little bit about the journey. And so I just decided that I would change courses and see how that eventuated. And and I'm, I'm still a lawyer today. So you finished... Um, you finished the to do is that me or been to be cost me i'm quiet today all right well, here we go um this is a unique that's experience. A very, <laughs> i apologize to the interpreters having um told all my colleagues off here uh so you but you finished a law degree and uh but you decided that you didn't want to go immediately into practice being a lawyer and you continued your studies so you became a Rhodes scholar uh, representing Western Australia. So that would have been a fairly significant step in the sense that you were leaving home, leaving Perth and heading off to Oxford. What was the experience of studying overseas? I think uh, for me in Oxford, in a... Um, a city and a town which was built perhaps before a time when the wheelchair was invented, it's fair to say that a lot of Oxford is not that easy to get around in a wheelchair. Um, cobble streets, older buildings did make life challenging. Living on my own made life enormously challenging. But for me, living in Oxford, it was about the life experience. Uh, I did get an appreciation of how people with a spinal cord injury may live without support networks around them and the challenges that they faced. And it made me understand and appreciate the importance of being a member of a community to support you. I got through my studies in Oxford, but when I compare my, my circumstances to some of my friends who are there, I would say that my focus was more on surviving and getting through each day where they thrived by being able to participate in far more extracurricular activities than what I did. Were you in a college? Yes, I was in a college. And the college were very supportive, but there's only so much you can do with um, spiral staircases and older buildings of that nature. So the best I could, in the circumstances, I just tried to take it one day at a time and get through the studies that were in front of me. So having had the experience in Oxford, you thought, right, well, now I'll go to New York. And you studied in New York as well. What was the experience like studying in New York? Uh, New York was slightly different to the United Kingdom in that the American with Disabilities Act has meant that the built environment is far more suitable for someone with a disability, particularly in more modern cities. But the United States healthcare system does take some getting used to. And so there was a balance between getting appropriate assistance at home with um, being able to complete my studies again. And I guess when I finished in the United Kingdom and New York, it did make me appreciate the enormous potential of the Australian healthcare system and disability support system going forward. Now, this hearing is about employment. So can I ask you some questions about your own experiences in employment sure. and some of the, the jobs that you've done over the course of your career, but also, as you point out towards the end of your statement, some of the barriers that you've experienced. So your work experience has essentially been in the law other than your most recent position as the commissioner. So you've worked in a large commercial law firm in Perth. Did you uh, choose that law firm or did they choose you? Are uh, they, well, I think it's a mutual decision. They chose me and I chose them, but uh, I was particularly fortunate that I was um, looking at getting 
recruited into a law job and I became or reasonably friendly with one of the human resources managers who worked for um, that law firm. And, and they asked me, well, what are the reasons why you may or may not take a job? And I said, what people fail to understand is the importance for me of accessing a bathroom and accessing a car park. And when I'd been doing my clerkships as a law student, I'd have to go to the bathroom in a public car park some distance from the building. Now, this is um, 20, oh, not quite 20 years ago, but nearly 20 years ago. And they said, well, we're renovating our premises. There'll be a, um, appropriate facilities on every floor and we're willing to make available a car park for you. And I had some job offers to move to Sydney for in different type roles, but for me, it was that ability and recognition of my particular needs in a situation which attracted me to work for them. And then you've held two roles that um, that lawyers would see as very coveted roles. One is you worked as an associate for a high court judge, and you've also worked assisting the Solicitor General for the Commonwealth. What attracted you to take on these very high profile roles in the law? I think when I got back from Oxford, uh, I was working in a commercial law firm, but I wanted to have a job where I felt like I was making a difference. And although um, I appreciate that, you know, many large law firms, they have extensive pro bono programs and things of that nature, it just worried and concerned me that my career was not going in the direction that I wanted to. So I applied to work at the High Court and when I was at the High Court, a job that became available while I was there was counsel assisting the Solicitor General. And in those particular roles, um, I was particularly lucky that some individuals took a really great interest in me. They reformed how they practiced to enable me to have the role. Um, in particular at the High Court, some of the adjustments and accommodations they made were um, absolutely fantastic and something which I very much value. And, but at the same time, I had to move to Canberra and try and live again on my own in Canberra. And one of the very real struggles that existed at that time was there was an absolute inability to find accessible housing. Mm -hmm. And so what I would actually do is I would live in university student housing to ensure that I could take the job because there was no available accessible housing for me at that time. Well, reading your statement and when you speak at the, the final part of your statement about your personal barriers to employment, housing is this recurrent theme for you. And if we look at your career where you've moved around to different countries and you've covered many places in Australia, has there ever been a place where the housing has been just spot on for what you needed? Or is the housing issue just this ongoing, recurrent issue that you have to turn your mind to every time you think about a job that you might be interested in taking on? Housing has been an incredibly challenging aspect of my life. Uh, it's been estimated that only 5% of houses in Australia are accessible. And last year in the concluding observations from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, one of the clear recommendations was that the Australia needs a mandatory access principles in its national construction code. And I would support that and so would research support that because in my witness statement, uh, I think it's a paragraph 102 or 108, there's an article by Provan, who, uh, an academic by the name of Provan, who works at the London School of Economics. And what they've said is that an inability to find accessible housing makes a person four times less likely to be employed. And so a lack of accessible housing can unfortunately greatly impact your ability to not just find a job, but build a career. Because what 
is so important for a person with disability to live independently is that if you have a house, you can start to set up the services to live your life. So for example, in my case, once I know where I'm living, I can obtain the necessary support services to come to where I live. And there can be a continuity of service to enable me to then seek employment and then not just seek a job, but a good job. And that requires time to set up, but the most primarily important thing for someone in my circumstances with a significant mobility disability is to have that built environment that is fit for purpose. So commissioners, you have a copy of the article, it's called No Place Like an Accessible Home, Quality of Life and Opportunity for Disabled People with Accessible Housing Needs. That is part of the uh, documents that Dr Gauntlet has provided to the Royal Commission and part of the material that's being tendered. Right, so By the I... way, in your present location, you've been able to find accommodation of the kind you need? Yes, I have, uh, Chair. What I have become astute at is perhaps being able to negotiate with landlords as to what is required, but it is in a situation where I'm far older, far more advanced in my career, and far more understanding as to how to, for example, negotiate an agreement whereby you might fix the house after you leave, to expect that of someone who's 25 or 30, who's never rented before or never lived out of home before is, I think, quite a significant difference. And so I think we have to understand that for housing people, particularly people with disabilities, they may come from all backgrounds. For example, English may not be a first language but they still have um, specific needs. And so within that needs that they have for housing, there shouldn't be a need to have to, ha to be able to negotiate a legal agreement to fix a house after you've left the house. So there is a balance between having housing policy, which is just available. Now, um, one thing I would say is, is that even coming into this role, the options for housing were incredibly limited. A person with a disability may want to live in a particular location because their work is nearby or a, um, a community group they want to be live is nearby. Um, at present in Australia, those options do not exist. Can we turn now to your role as the Disability Discrimination Commissioner? You were appointed to this role and commenced on the 7th of May last year, 2019. Yes. And your role as the Commissioner is essentially guided by the Disability Discrimination Act and the functions set out for the Human Rights Commission in the Australian Human Rights Commission Act. Yes, that's correct. So as the Disability Discrimination Commissioner, you are part of the Australian Human Rights Commission, sometimes called the AHRC, and you're one of seven commissioners. Yes, that's correct. And so the other commissioners, as many people will be aware, cover other subject matters, also reflective of legislation, Sex Discrimination Act, Age Discrimination Act, Race Discrimination Act. But there's also some other commissioners, a Human Rights Commissioner. Yes. An Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Yes. And a President. Yes. And so the commissioners work together on a, a holistic approach to human rights and the dysfunction, uh, the function of the, um, of, sorry, I'll, I'll take that back. They work together to deliver a human rights framework that meets the objectives of the AHRC Act. And this could be through conducting inquiries, undertaking research, doing policy. I think all of the commissioners give lots of speeches. How many have you done in your time? Uh, since uh, 1 July last year, up until the time of writing my statement, I think I've given 72 speeches and external presentations. So there's often high demand for the commissioners to come and speak at different forums about different issues, is that right? There is high demand and I think it's incredibly important that the Disability Discrimination Commissioner makes themselves available to 
particularly uh, people with disability in different locations in Australia. So I've tried to, to the fullest extent possible, make myself available and give speeches on issues as required. And you also uh, are involved in a number of outreach and consultation activities. So you, that means that you often are asked to become members, uh, a member of government and non-government committees. Can you tell us about some of the committees that you serve on? Uh, I think I sit on approximately 16 different committees. I sit on the National Accessible Transport Task Force. Um, I sit on the National Disability Insurance Scheme Independent Advisory Council. Uh, I also sit on the newly formed National Employment or Disability Employment Committee. Uh, there's also committees that relate to things such as electoral rules, uh, premises standards, etc., cetera, um, and education. So there's a lot of differing committees and one of the most important aspects of the disability discrimination commissioner role is that by sitting on those committees you can hopefully quietly and persuasively influence policy so that human rights for all Australians are respected. And uh, no doubt you have a vast staff to help you perform all of these functions, is that right? I don't know if I could say that I have a <laughs> vast staff. Um, Ms Eastman, I think uh, have a small but extremely competent, diligent. Um, I think I would like staff. to say I have a, a small but particularly able staff who are incredibly diligent and try to do their best in the circumstances. One thing to be aware of is that when you consider disability policy and the need for the views of people with disability to be eloquently articulated with government, there is no state equivalent of the Disability Discrimination Commissioner role. So there is a Commonwealth Disability Discrimination Commissioner, but there is no state equivalent. That means that in disability, it is necessary for the Disability Discrimination Commissioner to both work on a Commonwealth and a state level on particular issues. Each commissioner has two policy staff and one EA, and then can access a number of um, cross-cutting functions across the commission relating to communications, legal, strategic direction. But there is a significant amount of work when you consider the status of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the National Disability Strategy, and also the Disability Royal Commission and the need for the Australian Human Rights Commission to provide technical and appropriate assistance to ensure that we have good laws for all Australians and especially in the field of disability, it is important, I think, to always be mindful that there are certain people with a disability who very much struggle to advocate for themselves. And so the role of the Disability Discrimination Commissioner is always to speak on behalf of those people to make sure that they are remembered in policy discussions. One uh, feature of the work of the Australian Human Rights Commission has always been to be guided by international human rights law and particularly conventions or declarations that uh, are annexed to the Australian Human Rights Commission Act. And in the early days in disability, there were two declarations that we find in the back of the AHRC Act and these well predate the Convention on the Rights of Disability, People with Disabilities. In terms of your work, how important is the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities to how you do your work and the approach that you take to policy? Uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is in a sense, um, the primary document from which I need to refer to, to discharge my function. It's important to acknowledge that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, or CRPD as it's often called, is the latest human rights treaty that's been created internationally. And so it reflects world's best practice in a number of areas. It has sophisticated um, feedback relating to issues such as data collection, the role of monitoring. It understands importantly the issues of intersectionality 
and considering issues such as gender as a cross-cutting theme. And in areas such as employment and housing, it is both progressive in understanding to the need to both develop good policy, but also to end issues such as segregation, which can create enormous problems for society now and in the future. So, Commissioners, the uh, Human Rights Commission has provided a very detailed submission in response to this Royal Commission's issues paper on employment. And we've included a copy of that submission in the evidence. And Dr Gauntlet, you're familiar with that submission. Yes. And it speaks to the operation of Article 27 of the Convention. Is there anything you want to say about the importance of Article 27 in the work that you've done on employment? And then we'll come back and look at sort of some of the specific um, areas where you've worked on. I think the best way to frame the importance of Article 27 in the work I've done in employment is to relate that back to the findings of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in their concluding observations issued in October last year. And what the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities found was that in Australia, it was important to acknowledge that there were some good instances of practice, such as the Australian Public Services aim to have 7% people with disability in employment was regarded as good practice, but there were significant concerns with the operation of Australian disability enterprises and paying people above award wages in open employment or that when they would be paid in open employment and the operation of supported wage assessment mechanisms to ensure that people were not able to access employment because in part, this could be discriminatory in nature. What has been found is I think that approximately only 0.8% of people, and this is quoted in our submissions, move from Australian disability enterprises into open employment. But one of the justifications for this type of employment is to enable people to, in a sense, um, improve how they would be employed. That is, in a sense, train them to be better at their jobs. So there is a very real and important issue for the issue of how people are viewed uh, in employment to be considered. Another important recommendation that was made by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability was to follow the Willing to Work report. The Willing to Work report was compiled by my predecessor, the late Susan Ryan, who is a particularly respected age and disability discrimination commissioner, um, following extensive consultation throughout the community where she considered both age and disability discrimination, dis disability discrimination in the workforce. And Commissioner Ryan came up with a number of very important recommendations relating to such things as the work as potentially having the Workplace Gender Equality Agency report on issues such as disability and age education campaigns and also the role of the Australian Human Rights Commission as providing an educative function in employment. And so that particular report is incredibly, as I see it, is incredibly important for both um, discharging our human rights obligations, but also as a touchstone to what is good and effective practice in employment going forward. I might um, come in a moment to ask you about some of the quite specific recommendations as they touch on people with disability, but can I come back to the convention? So the convention itself, while Australia is a party to the convention, the rights in the convention are not automatically part of Australian law and they can't be enforced automatically by Australian courts. And the Royal Commission has heard evidence from Rosemary Caius uh, in a number of hearings talking about that gap between the rights as they exist in international law and how they translate into Australian law. But one way the convention rights translate into Australian law in the area of employment is through the Disability Discrimination Act. And that's your, you're the custodian of that legislation. So can I ask you some questions now about how the DDA, if I can use the shorthand, sure. actually works in the area of employment? Mm -hmm. So uh, you've dealt with this again in your statement, but the way the DDA works, and tell me if I'm right on this, is that there's a part of the DDA that says there are going to be areas of public life where uh, doing certain things will be unlawful. 
And one part of the DDA deals with work and that covers employment, people working as commission agents or contractors, partners in partnerships of more than six, qualifying bodies and employment agencies. So it covers a wide area of work, not just the traditional employer-employee relationship. Is that right? That's correct. If we take just employer-employee, there's a provision in the Act, Section 15, and that addresses a number of aspects of employment. The first bit is in pre-employment. So there's certain things that employers can't do in the processes of recruiting somebody for a job. Is that right? Yes. And then once a person does get a job, there are going to be certain things that employers can't do to employees in their employment. Is that right? Yes. And that includes such things as particular terms and conditions that might apply only to a person with disability, denying access to benefits, denying opportunities for promotion associated yep. with employment, dismissing, terminating somebody's employment. And then there's this catch-all called any other detriment. Yes. What does the any other detriment <laughs> cover? Can that be anything that I don't like something happening? Is that a detriment in employment? Well, it relates to, um, first of all, what you do is you, in a sense, there is the employment relationship what's required then the any other detriment aspect of that is in a sense, a bit of a catch all. But what you have to be aware of is that there is also the Fair Work Act, which does regulate employment. I'm going to get to the Fair Work Act. Then, I'm just going to keep you okay. in the DDA at the moment. But then within the DDA, in terms of how you assess whether discrimination occurs, there are two limbs. Yep. There's, so that's the next step. Okay. Right. So the first step is we've got to get in yep. so to we, the area, either in the recruitment phase or in the, um, the, the relationship phase. If we've ticked that box, it'll be unlawful if the definitions of discrimination are satisfied. So there's two primary definitions that we look at. And the chair's referred to this earlier in the week. One is called, in shorthand, direct discrimination. And the other is called indirect discrimination. This is a very complex area in terms of the legal thing. So give us the lay person's understanding of direct and then indirect discrimination. I think the best way to describe direct discrimination is an inequality of treatment on the persons on the basis of their disability, where indirect discrimination is an inequality of impact on the basis of the person's disability. So what would be an example of direct discrimination? How might that occur in an employment setting? An example of direct discrimination would be where you specifically exclude a person from working solely on the basis of their disability. Maybe the person has a hearing issue and you say, we're not going to allow people with that disability to work for us. Now the indirect discrimination is a trickier area. And so that requires somebody to have to comply with a condition, a requirement, a policy or practice in the workplace. And because of their disability, they can't comply with that condition or requirement. How does then indirect discrimination work from there? Is there anything more that has to be considered before you make a finding of indirect discrimination? Well, I think when you consider indirect discrimination, what we're looking at is an inequality of, is that by treating people the same way, you may have an inequality of impact, but there is also a necessary issue is to consider whether a reasonable adjustment could take place in the circumstances. Okay. Um, it is, unfortunately, a very fact-based inquiry. So a person with a disability up front, deciding upon whether they've been discriminated against, can find it particularly challenging to decide upon. And so with an inequality of treatment that occurs to have indirect discrimination, it may be that you treat two employees in the same way, but because of an individual's disability, the effect of that is different. So can I use an example perhaps for you? Is if um, if you were looking for a job at a law firm and you were asked to come for an interview and you arrived at the law firm, but you had to get to the first floor to be able to get to an interview. 
the, your, um, another candidate who's competing for that job also has to get to the first floor for that interview. So you're both treated the same in terms of where you have to go. But the effect there's no, different. let me say, there's no lift, there's no ramp, there's nothing. So you're treated exactly the same way, but the outcome for you is different. You don't even get into the door of the interview. Is that indirect discrimination? Yes. Okay. So the example of indirect discrimination is really looking at when people, for the most part, are treated in exactly the same way, but that treatment that's the same has a disproportionate adverse outcome for, in this case, a person with disability. Is that how I would look at it? Yes. But there's a kicker in this, isn't it? And that is the question of whether or not the imposition of that particular requirement or condition or policy is reasonable in all of the circumstances. Yes. Now, in re looking at reasonable, what's involved in looking at reasonable and who bears the onus of proving that a requirement or condition is reasonable? Uh, the issue of reasonable, so when a complainant brings a claim, they bear the onus of proving that something's discriminatory in nature, and that would include that they've been treated unreasonably. The definition of reasonable adjustment within the Act is a definition which is refers back to the notion of, or the concept of unjustifiable hardship. Mm -hmm. And so what is a reasonable adjustment is, in a sense, directly related to what is not unjustifiable hardship. I'm going to come to reasonable sure. adjustment, but I'm going to give you an example, and perhaps one of the commissioners who's sitting on this inquiry may know about it. And this is before reasonable adjustments. If, for example, there's a large convention centre in a capital city of a state, and the convention centre is built, but there also has to be stairs, and it's not particularly accessible, then would that give rise to a claim of indirect discrimination? I'm testing you against one of the commissioners who might have determined a case like this in a, a formal Yes, life. I'm aware that um, <laughs> Justice Atkinson may have determined this case, and it's, I think it um, relates to an individual by the name of Kevin Cox. <laughs> He's now um, In Queensland. Uh, yes, there is an issue with discrimination in that city. Well, the argument was, you know, you don't have to go up the front stairs. You can drive in the back door and... That will get you there. And I'm, I know this is not an employment case, but if, for example, in the example I gave you and somebody said, oh, look, you can't get up the stairs to the first floor, but we'll come and do the interview in the coffee shop down the road. We do it in the back of the local fast food shop. Is that discrimination? It, it, it's obviously a very factually dependent yeah. inquiry, but I would argue that in that circumstances, it is discrimination. Yeah. So the adjustment is not reasonable. But uh, uh, it's, a, it's an area which is tricky from time to time, as you say, it's very fact-based, is that right? Absolutely, and I think one of the things that we all have to be aware of is that um, not every person with disability has a legal background, not every person with disabilities first language is English, and not every person with disability has access to legal representation or wants to avail themselves of those rights. So we need to have a um, multitude of policy frameworks to ensure that people with disabilities can get not just a job, but a good job. Mm -hmm. But at all times, we also need to have that very clear foundation of a legal system that does protect fundamental rights for people as well. Well, you've mentioned reasonable adjustments. And when I was taking you through what is the outline of where it will be unlawful to discriminate in employment in the recruitment phase and while somebody's working. I mentioned their terms and conditions, access to benefits or promotions associated with employment, dismissing or any other detriment. But there's no positive obligation, is there, in the employment provisions that an employer has to provide a reasonable adjustment? And no. that concept of reasonable adjustment is not a standalone concept. There's no right to a reasonable adjustment. We only get to the question of reasonable adjustments when we look at the definitions of direct and indirect discrimination. Is that right? That's correct. And that word or that phrase reasonable adjustment, that word reasonable is actually superfluous. It's got nothing to do with the adjustment. Uh, well, I wouldn't... Um... 
want to cast too many dispersions on the drafters, Miss Eastman, but I would, what I would say is that the Disability Discrimination Act is extraordinarily difficult for a person without legal training to understand and that we need to have a statute that is fit for purpose for all people with disability to enable them to avail themselves of their rights if needed, but also to guide employers as to what is good conduct at the same time. And when you've talked about reasonable adjustment then in the context of direct and indirect discrimination, one of the policy changes that we submit is that there should potentially be a positive duty inserted into the Disability Discrimination Act to ensure that substantive equality takes yeah. place. And there are, in the UK, this occurs, and in, in Victoria, to a lesser extent, this occurs, although not as successfully as we would have hoped. But what we do need to balance is a balance between having a legal system that protects fundamental rights, that is strong and enforceable and easily enforceable to protect people with disabilities, but also that guides employers so that they're comfortable employing people with disability and having discussions about disability in a way that's constructive. But the, the DDA doesn't have that model at all. And the concept of reasonable adjustments is really around what adjustment is a, something to be done up to the point that it imposes an unjustifiable hardship on an employer. That's the model, isn't it? That's correct. So that's not a model that's really encouraging adjustments to be made in a positive way. It's a model that's very much focused on at what point does the obligation to make the adjustment end because it will impose an unjustifiable hardship. I think the complaints-based model and the model of um, setting limiting principles and then having reasonable adjustment sort of interpreted or the inherent requirements for job interpreted as well, which is another exception mm. um, under the Disability Discrimination Act can be and are problematic in nature for people with disability and need to be reviewed. But that review cannot happen in isolation from other laws and also other policy frameworks to ensure that employers feel comfortable employing people with disability and that there is sufficient information that people with disability will apply for jobs and get not just a job, but a good job. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns that exists for me is that what we want is a practical system so that people with disability are obtaining jobs, but not seeking to, or being put in a situation rather, where they may have to go to court readily to enforce their rights we need a better system than that, whereby what actually happens is that there is trust and confidence between both parties to have good and meaningful employment relationships where when concerns are raised, those concerns can be dealt with amicably and understandably and so that we can then have good outcomes. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has recently reviewed what is the co average cost of accommodation for a person with disability and it's $650. And I think they reviewed or found that 88% of people with disability don't need any type of reasonable accommodation whatsoever. So we do need to try and get the balance right between having an incredibly rigorous Disability Discrimination Act, which protects rights, but also trying to get workable long-term relationships for people with disability with their employers so they can build careers. You, you've mentioned inherent requirements and that is a, another exception to what might be unlawful discrimination. And inherent requirements is looking at a particular job and asking what's absolutely essential to the performance of that job, not just the tasks to be done, but the circumstances in which the job's performed. And if someone can't do the inherent requirements of the job, even with some adjustments, then if an employer refuses to employ a person with disability or uh, does something in the employment relationship, including termination, that won't be unlawful. Do you have a view on how Australia's travelled with uh, dealing with inherent requirements in the job? 
I think uh, the best way of putting it for inherent requirements, reasonable adjustments, the Disability Discrimination Act more generally is that I have a concern that the act as it operates at a practical level is not as effective as we would have hoped. Mm -hmm. And that people with disability do not know what their rights are in certain situations and that they are required to bear the burden of enforcing those rights. There is a place for an organ, either someone acting on behalf of the person with a disability or the Australian Human Rights Commission potentially bringing actions on behalf of certain particular, of certain individuals with disability who may be especially marginalised. But with that need to reform laws, to constantly make them fit for purpose, there is also an aspect of making sure that the employers understand those laws so that they feel comfortable employing people with disability. And so that when there are disputes, that they can be resolved amicably and quickly. I want to ask you about the work of the Human Rights Commission in receiving complaints. And that's not a specific function you have. The President of the Human Rights Commission has the function of receiving complaints and then the oversight of the investigation and conciliation of complaints to the Human Rights Commission. So you're not actively involved in sorting out those complaints. That's correct. All right. So if someone was to make a, a complaint about the way in which they were treated in employment, and I, can I add also there, we hadn't touched on section 35 of the act, which makes it unlawful for a person to be harassed in their employment. So that concept of harassment is also in the act. But if somebody- And, and that's uh, undeniably, it's incredibly important. It's also important to realise that the act doesn't have an intersectional operation. Um, people with disabilities have genders, they have racial backgrounds, they have culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And we need to recognise that um, intersectional basis upon which they live in terms of protecting their rights. So somebody, so the model at the moment, as you said, is really about setting out the areas where it's unlawful. And if unlawfulness occurs, the onus is on the person who's experienced the discrimination or believes that they've experienced discrimination to have to then go to the Human Rights Commission by making a complaint. So they don't physically have to go, but they can do something online or write a letter. So a complaint goes into the Human Rights Commission. Somebody says, I've been sacked from my job because of disability. What happens after a complaint goes in? Well, they come before the, um, it goes into a different stream or section of the Australian Human Rights Commission. and the matters dealt with by conciliation between the parties. And if the conciliation doesn't resolve the matter, then the matter can proceed to the federal court or the federal circuit court for resolution. So the conciliation, is that public? Can members of the public come and watch a conciliation in action? Uh, no, the conciliation is private in nature. And most uh, complaints are resolved by conciliation, aren't they? I think that is the case, although I'd have to check on the exact statistics, but uh, I'm under the impression that most this um, complaints are resolved by by conciliation, but the exact no, data okay. points I don't have to, to hand. Right. You have included in the submission to this Royal Commission on the employment issues, some of the statistics about the uh, proportion of complaints that come to the Human Rights Commission across mm -hmm. all the different areas, mm -hmm. race, age, sex, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. Uh, that disability is a very sort of high level of complaints, particularly in employment. So I've got to put up yeah. on the screen just the table that you've provided yeah, for this, us so we've got a sense of This the table is from Appendix A of our written submissions. Um, to give you some background, the highest level of complaints to the Australian Human Rights Commission is in disability. It averages a little bit over 40% per year. And amongst those complaints, a significant proportion of those relate to employment. And these figures relate to the employment, the percentage of employment complaints out of the disability complaints that are filed. Now, let me put, you may not have an answer to this, uh, but you may have a comment on it. The Royal Commission's heard over the course of this week that there are 4.4 million people in Australia with disability. And in terms of the proportion of people with disability who are working, it's about 53, 54%. We have heard over the course of this week uh, from the research done that 
one of the number one issues that people with disability feel in their employment is that feeling of being discriminated against or stigmatised. If you're looking at a cohort of something around 2 million people, and that is a, a, an experience that people experience in the workplace, that's a very small number of complaints as a proportion of the number of people with disability who may be working and having that experience. Would you agree with that? It is a small number of complaints, but I think we also have to uh, perhaps realise that you can judge the efficacy of a policy system on outcomes. And when you have a participation rate of 53% in the community for people with disability, which is 30% lower than people who do not have a disability, that is a significant problem. When you have median income in terms of earnings, which is half for people with disability and those people who don't have a disability, again, that is a significant problem. One way to look at those figures is to also say that people worry that in going to the Australian Human Rights Commission, whether the outcome they will get justifies the effort to make that complaint. If a person makes a complaint, it invariably has the practical effect of causing enormous angst with their employer going forward. So they will invariably have to change jobs. Now, if a person is worried about their ability to obtain another job, because they have some concerns that it was so difficult to get the first job, they're less likely to complain because they may just take upon that conduct and see it as suitable, or they might just quit their job because they're worried that they might get that next job. Mm -hmm. So I think those figures need to be seen in the context mm -hmm. of an otherwise challenging employment um, environment for people with disability in the community. Well, even if you make your way to the Human Rights Commission with a complaint, and assuming the majority of complaints are resolved by a confidential and private conciliation process, if the complaint can't be resolved by conciliation at the Human Rights Commission, the next step is for the person to decide whether they want to bring a court proceeding either in the federal court or the federal circuit court. Is that right? Yes. And we call those as lawyers cost jurisdictions, which means that if you lose the case, you not only have to pay your own lawyer's costs, but also the costs of the other lawyers representing the employer, for example. Yes. And some people say, oh, we don't see very many cases in the courts about disability discrimination in employment. Do you have a view as to why that might be? I think it is a fair reflection of the state of Australian case law that we do not have a significant number of cases in Australian courts relating to disability discrimination in employment. But it also needs to be understood that there is a time component in that process in that from the point of when discrimination may have taken place to the resolution of the dispute may be a matter of years. And that person in a sense may be putting their life on hold whilst this dispute is being resolved. So the expectation that a person with a disability will see from the point of, dis of discrimination or alleged discrimination all the way to judgment in a federal court matter is one that requires a particular funding for that individual and also time for that individual to bring the case. And in those circumstances, I think it's incredibly important to be realistic about whether a person with a disability would be able to put their life on hold to that extent and also have the costs and the financial means to do so. Another aspect of those cases to be aware of is that a person with a disability may need to provide expert evidence on a certain issue. They may not have ready access to a particular expert where an employer may. They may so, even have to prove they have a disability, don't they? That's correct. And so there are some issues with forensic aspects of bringing the claim and access to documents, which mean it is unlikely that we would have a significant number of disability discrimination cases for employment in the federal court. Now, in we, we should sorry. perhaps uh, uh, identify the constitutional constraints. There was once upon a time 
uh, the availability to the Human Rights Commission, or under the name it then had, to determine complaints itself, and then the High Court said that this was inconsistent with yeah, I think the separation of powers under I the Australian Constitution. I think it's branding the human rights thing off I would certainly is. This is a 1984 decision. Um, That's right. Oh, so you are a casualty in a way of the purity of judicial power. Um, obviously and, I and I don't have to remind you, Chair, that the states, of course, don't have the same problem. Okay. <laughs> So, in fact, thank, thank you, you, Commissioner Atkinson, because that was my next question, <laughs> was in addition to the Commonwealth law, there are other laws that give remedies for discrimination on the grounds of disability and employment. There's the Fair Work Act. So if you are uh, unfairly dismissed because of disability, there's a remedy there. There's the general protections provisions in the Fair Work Act. And that has a provision that specifically identifies physical or mental disability, but not other disabilities. But that provision has a reverse onus. So if somebody says, oh, I've experienced adverse action, then there's a, an onus on the employer to prove that they didn't act, for example, because of somebody's physical or mental disability. So there's that provision. And then there's a whole raft of state and territory laws that also provide remedies for discrimination. So if I'm an employee with a disability and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to take on a complaint, uh, you've given us a very comprehensive overview of the Commonwealth Disability Discrimination Act, but how do I work out whether I go to your commission or whether I go out to Parramatta here in Sydney to anti-discrimination New South Wales or down the road here to William Street to the Fair Work Commission? How do I work all of that out? Well, I think perhaps the, the pragmatic response to you is that you would have to seek legal advice on what is the best avenue for which you to proceed upon. And whilst there are certain benefits in perhaps going through the general protections route, though there are significantly short time frames involved, mm -hmm. Um, or potentially going to a state-based resolution mechanism, although there are slight differences in procedure and the definition of disability and whether there's a positive duty in Victoria, for example, mm. the crux of the concerning issue remains, which is that an individual bears the onus of that complaint to bring it upon themselves to go to the particular dispute resolution mechanism, and that can take an enormously long period of time it can be incredibly stressful and that person ultimately may receive a resolution which is quite modest in nature. And so it puts on that person with disability a tremendous challenge, which what we want to have is a system whereby both the employer and the employee understand their obligations in a way that we can have as many people with disabilities in not just a job, but a good job. So it's really coming back to the fundamentals of an employment relationship, which is one of mutual trust and confidence rather than mutual suspicion and distrust. So do we need laws that better build and, and work on that foundation of mutual trust and confidence? I don't know if the answer is, um, better laws to create mutual trust and confidence, Ms. Eastman. I think there's a really important issue here about giving people the appropriate the training and awareness of disability so that a person with a disability can, in the right circumstances, feel comfortable revealing what they need mm -hmm. and that an employer will be respectful in those situations of what's being requested. It is ultimately the employment, sorry, the employment relationship ultimately is guided by two parties getting on well and being able to reveal aspects of themselves to each other to enable that you have good outcomes. The best employment relationships I've been in as a person with disability, there was trust and confidence. And that trust and confidence is built over time. But to have trust and confidence, I think, People with a disability need to be sure that they have fundamental rights which are respected and can be relied upon. 
but also we need to train and upskill our employers to ensure that when they employ people with disability, they're confident about having dis difficult discussions to ensure that people with disability are not just in the building, but they're properly included. And that takes me, I think, neatly to the willing to work report and the recommendations. So you've spoken a little earlier about Susan Ryan's work on the willing to work report. And in your statement at paragraph 45, commissioners, Dr. Gauntlet set out some of the key recommendations in relation to uh, addressing the issues that you've just touched on. Do you want to talk about any of the particular recommendations, particularly around national education campaigns, expanding an agency like the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to deal with equality and diversity more generally. Do you want to speak about some of those recommendations? I assume these recommendations have not been implemented. Uh, I, I can say, for instance, that the um, expansion of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to cover disability has definitely not occurred. Uh, I am um, aware that there is some work in relation to the education of employers relating to people with disability through government agencies. But what I would say is we need a centralised approach to that that is more comprehensive in nature. Um, and one of the recommendations of the Willing to Work report, I think it's a rec recommendation 29, was that the Australian Human Rights Commission create a sort of resource in relation to getting together with a number of large employers, unions and relevant individuals to create an employment body that or employment resource for people with disabilities to deal with issues relating to employment. Dealing with the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and why that's important is that we know, or the reform of that agency, we know from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that data and the measuring of outcomes is an incredibly important part of disability policy more generally. The National Disability Strategy or the previous National Disability Strategy, which, which was entered into in 2010, unfortunately didn't have a data framework that was implemented. That meant that a lot of the aspects of it were unfortunately not followed through on as we would have hoped. By measuring disability related employment issues, I think we get a better understanding in Australia as to where improvements can be made and where good policy can be created. In terms of the education campaign that we, that we have or should have, the concern that exists is that what we need is that people with disability are not viewed as objects of charity, but we emphasise the strengths of people with disability and what they can do. What people sometimes fail to understand or appreciate is a person having a disability throughout their life can mean that that individual has a lot of soft skills that are incredibly important to an employer. They can be really good at solving problems. They can be quite logical in nature. They can work particularly well in teams and they can resolve issues or be able to discuss issues in a way that's respectful and deal with the, deal with the public in a way that is um, useful and enables that individual with a disability to be a very good communicator. So when we talk about disability, too often we look at the, the things that they cannot do rather than the things they can. And particularly in large organisations, they can find their place or niche in particular aspects of that organisation, which means that that person can give, can be a really valuable team member over time. And as employees, we know that people with disabilities are less likely to be sick they're more likely to stay in their jobs for a long time, and they're often incredibly loyal to the particular organisation that employs them. The recommendation that the Australian Human Rights Commission should in a sense become a thought leader in disability employment is something which I strongly advocate for. One of the challenges for young people in particular with disability is to look at the dis people that they're dealing with and saying, is that me? This is something you've been looking at this it year. Is, it and is. Can you tell the Royal Commission a little bit about what you've been working on this year during the COVID-19 pandemic with young people? Sure. So um, it, it's traditional or it's 
Coppin, that a commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission will have a series of priorities during their term. And each, I was appointed for five years. And one of my priorities is the employment of people with disability. And the reason why I advocate for the employment of people with disability is when people with disability are employed in good jobs in open employment, it is reflective of a disability policy system that is working well. That is, they have appropriate home assistance, there's transport, there's housing, the values of the community are ones which respect people with disability. We've researched what is a way to make a substantive difference to the area of employment and received some philanthropic seed funding to set up a uh, communications resource, which is a website, and to work with 10 to 12 of Australia's largest employers to try and create a system whereby with the buy-in from the highest levels of those organisations, being the CEO and the board. Are these public or private sector organisations? They would be both. And what would happen is that it would be based along analogous principles to male champions of change, where we come together and we talk about how to resolve disability employment in an open and transparent manner, but also along with that, uh, in a sense, champions network or key employer network, we would have 10 to 12 people with a disability who would function as ambassadors to guide the program going forward so that they could give their input on what is good disability policies within an organisation. We would then make that information, once settled, publicly available on a website so that both people with a disability but employers all over Australia understand how to have innovative disability employment programs going forward. And by committing at the highest levels of these organisations to the importance of disability employment, what we hope to do is to change the nature of the discussion. Instead of having a nature of discussion of why employment with disability, we want it to be why not? We want organisations when they consider issues like diversity to understand that disability is the equivalent of any other diversity characteristic that exists. And when organisations talk about things like sustainable development goals, and they talk about the importance of human rights, we want the largest organisations in Australia to realise that disability is firmly in those discussions. Sustainable Development Goal 8.5 explicitly refers to disability employment. But if you look at the human rights reports that are written by some of our largest companies, disability is dealt with in a silent manner. We need the largest organisations in Australia and employers to step forward and show leadership, to say that we can employ people with disability throughout our organisations in a number of key roles. And we're gonna be open and transparent about telling the story how we do. The reason why the Australian Human Rights Commission and myself as Disability Discrimination Commissioner are so passionate about this role is that, or this particular project, is that by entering into the project and setting it up in the way we do, we think we can create an example where others will get on board and see that it's possible to not just do it, but do it well. And it can be a differentiator in the private market that how you employ people with disabilities is something that's valued. <laughs> And so when we look at the sort of the key constituent elements to the program, there's um, buy-in or sign-off or commitment from the CEO and or the board of the organisation, the existence of an ambassador's advisory network of people with disability to guide the program, a communications resource which is open to all people to look at, to learn from, and to encourage people with disability and regular forums relating to the particular organisation where we try to talk about what is good practice in disability employment so that it becomes normalised. Dr Gauntlet, there's lots of other questions that I'd like to ask you and I'm going to ask the commissioners whether they have any questions. I'm conscious commissioners of the sure. time that we have available this morning. Yes. 
<clears throat> Thank you. I'm sure there are many questions that could take a great deal of time, but I shall ask first Commissioner Atkinson. Thank you, Dr. Gauntlet. I think your ideas that you've just expressed fully are, are really interesting and will be very useful. Thank you for your evidence today. Commissioner Galbally. Um, thank you very much for that um, very fulsome evidence. Um, no questions, thank you. And Commissioner Ryan. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I do. Um, Mr. Gauntlet, um, you've said to us that you have a concern that the Act as it operates, I'm quoting you, at a practical level is not as effective as we would hope. My friend, as having been an employer, I recall being very concerned about unfair dismissal, work health and safety, public liability, even gender discrimination, are things that we know employers are incredibly concerned about because they're worried about the legal consequences of failure in that area. Yesterday, we had a witness come to us with evidence that uh, they were a lollipop person and uh, their employer was actually considering dismissing them because they were worried about the implications of the Work Health and Safety Act because they had to wear a brace for a medical condition that they had. Um, look, is it not a fact that the system you've just described, the legal framework you've just described, is something which employers are routinely taking absolutely no notice? They would take the view that being taken to the anti-discrimination commission as being thrashed with a wet lettuce and they would take the view that there's nothing to be concerned about so they continue to ignore it is it not a case that not only is it not as effective as we want that it just isn't working at all and we actually need to fundamentally change the act root and branch so that people have a very clear message that discriminating against people with disability is against the law and unacceptable I, um, I'm not sure I'm willing to use such evocative metaphors as whipping people with a wet lettuce, Commissioner. <laughs> but what I would say is that the point you have raised about employers perhaps um, not considering some of these laws appropriately is one that has a fair basis to make. However, we need to create a legal system going forward that both protects the rights of people with disability, enables them to be potentially represented by a third party so that they do not have to bring an application for discrimination for themselves, much like the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission can do in areas such as consumer protection. But at the same time, we want to create a system which is simple and fair so that employers do not feel anxious about employing people with disability, but that we create a system where employment flourishes. And to do so, there is a balance between having regulation that is fair, strong and rigorously enforced, but also trying to create a circumstance where discussions about training um, of staff, of how to have difficult discussions concerning communication can take place. In my witness statement, I refer to an article by an, uh, a group of Canadian academics, um, one of which the lead authors was by the name of Bonaccio. And what in that particular article that's referred to, they note some of the concerns that employers have in employing people with disability from a psychological perspective. We need to, yes, have very effective laws and they need a significant review, but that cannot be distanced from other issues such as the mindset of employers of how to undertake employment. It can also not be distanced from issues such as housing, public transport and home support, because we need to ensure that people with disability can get to work and can get to work and be fit and healthy when they're at work to discharge their responsibilities. So I agree with you, what you've said to a limited extent, but I think it's got to be part of a broader view of disability policy more generally to achieve the outcomes which you assert. Right, you described to us what had to happen for a person to bring a complaint to the ADV about under the DDA. What chance is someone whose default position is the DSP, who possibly earns, you know, the equivalent of um, $20,000 a year in their three-day-a-week part-time job, 
what chances there of them participating in that process at all? Well, they can participate in the process because to, to bring an action to the Australian Human Rights Commission, it's a cost-free jurisdiction. But whether they participate effectively is what is an important issue. And I think what I would say to that is, is that there is a significant concern that they would need to seek legal representation, and that's a problem. Yes, but, it is. But well, that's impossible, isn't it? But the way to get that person to be appropriately represented is the funding of advocacy, it's the funding of representative organisations and it's enabling a representative organisation to have standing to bring the claim on their behalf to ensure that their rights can be enforced. Okay. In your submission to the Commission and uh, to the issues paper and uh, even today, by your own observation, only seven of the top rated ASX listed companies has a disability action plan. That would suggest, I think, that was code for this is not something that is top of mind in the big companies of Australia. Um, the labour, you've also said the labour workforce participation rate has remained 30% lower for people with disabilities than, uh, than for the rest of Australia and that that has been the case for a really long time, decades in fact. If we were to make progress quickly on this, what are among the 30 odd recommendations in the willing to work and some additional ones that you brought, where have we got to start? Because I suspect governments are looking for advice as to where we would might, might start to make progress quickly. I suspect you are the person that's likely to give this advice. Where have we got to start at its most urgent? I would reform the, reform the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to have a disability arm to it, to correct data on that perspective. I would undertake a national education campaign on this issue. I would reform the Disability Discrimination Act to provide standing to representative organisations to bring claims on behalf of individuals. I would provide funding for the equivalent of the Australian Human Rights Commission to undertake the process which we foreshadowed to act as a disruptor to provide information in question. And I would look closely, I would look closely at reforming the disability employment services system to ensure that in that particular system that there was longer requirements before payment took place to ensure that people were placed in not just a job but a good job and finally i would look very closely at reforming the disability support pension and payments of that nature so that if a person was to seek employment that they wouldn't have the concern that their benefits would be compromised if they were six or they tried and failed we need to give people with disability a better option of trying and failing in employment one of the underlying premises, though, Commissioner, that is incredibly important is for Australia to have a good employment system relating to people with disability, we need to have a national disability strategy that is fit for purpose. Because we need to also ensure that people can get to work easily, that they're looked after at home and that they're in appropriate housing. You can have all the employment programs in the world, but if you don't have housing for the person, they're never going to be able to seek employment. We know from research that to renovate a house is 22 times more expensive than it is to build with universal design up front. So in terms of what you've requested, there are some very good recommendations in the willing to work, which we say should be adopted. There is some reform to the Disability Discrimination Act that should of course take place. But above all, Underlying that, it needs to be appreciated that we need a national disability strategy that is rigorous and fit for purpose. And within that now, we also probably need a national disability data asset that accompanies that to ensure that when we implement policies, we know that they are good policies going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chief, and thank you, Mr. Bondi. Has the uh, Human Rights Commission ever sought amendments to the legislation to enable it to, to have the powers that the ACCC has to bring actions on behalf of others, bring representative actions and so forth? I couldn't answer that question. I've only been in the job for approximately 18 months. Um, I suspect they probably have. At the moment, we have a review of disability discrimination law under um, there's a free and equal review that's taking place. It is important also to acknowledge that it doesn't necessarily have to be the Australian Human Rights Commission that occupies that role. It could be a Fair Work Ombudsman, it could be a disability type um, regulator of that nature. So there, there could as, be 
be potentially constitutional constraints with what is the role of the Australian Human Rights Commission in enforcing areas such as that. But I think the point that I was seeking to make was that there is a place for a systemic regulator with teeth to be able to enforce some of these issues so that where we had egregious human rights issues or egregious issues of discrimination, they were enforced. The enforcement is uh, critical because uh, the enactment of laws that impose penalties for certain behaviour will require conduct of a particular kind, not self-executing. We saw that with the Banking Royal Commission financial institutions. It wasn't a deficiency in the law, but nonetheless, the largest financial institutions proceeded to breach many of the laws. And one of the recommendations or findings made by the judge for whom you worked previously was uh, just obey the law. And it's not necessarily that simple to get people, particularly large organisations, to obey the law. It is a challenge to get large organisations to obey the law, but maybe the equivalent challenge to that is we need to get our largest companies in Australia to realise that sometimes the most important human rights issues are on their own doorstep. And one of the most important human rights issues in Australia that's on our own doorstep is the employment of people with disability. When an organisation seeks to refer to such issues as the Sustainable Development Goals, disability should be part of how they reference those goals. But if only seven out of the top 50 ASX listed companies are filing disability action plans with the Australian Human Rights Commission, it reflects a silence towards disability issues, which is concerning. When we talk about diversity, we often talk about gender, race, ethnicity, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people of a sexual orientation. Women have disabilities. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have disabilities. Culturally and linguistically diverse people have disabilities. People of diverse sexual orientations have disabilities. You're not appropriately considering diversity if you don't consider disability in that discussion. For the area, for, the, for employment of people with disability in Australia to improve and improve in a way that is profound and different, we need the boardrooms and the chief executives of Australia to review, to see disability as the equivalent of other diversity characteristics and step forward and seek to make a change. Thank you, Dr. Gauntlet. Uh, perhaps we might see that as part of the Royal Commission's work in due course. Uh, I want to thank you and your office on behalf of the Royal Commission for the assistance that you have provided in the responses to issues papers and other forms of engagement with the Royal Commission. It has been invaluable as has your evidence uh, today, the documentation you've provided us with, and uh, the ideas that uh, we will have to grapple with uh, as we continue our work, uh, and particularly, of course, in this area. So thank you very much for your contribution today and more generally. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gauntlet. Uh, commissioners, uh, We'll adjourn now till 20 past 12 Sydney time, 20 past 11 Brisbane time. Yes. When we come back, uh, I will ask to go straight to Brisbane to Ms Fraser, who's going to deal with some of the evidence from witnesses who haven't come in person to give their evidence to the Royal Commission. And then we'll turn to our final witnesses, final two sets of witnesses for the day. And that will be done by you. You will take those witnesses. Yes. Yes, thank you. All right, well, it's now 12 noon Sydney time, more or less. Um, we'll adjourn till 12.20 Sydney time, 11.20 Brisbane time, thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal yeah. Commission is now resumed. Yes, uh, Ms Fraser. Commissioners, I would like to read into evidence the statement of a witness who uses the pseudonym Jamie. You will find a copy of Jamie's statement sworn 18 November 2020 at Tender Bundle Part A, Tab 15. I ask you to tender this statement into evidence and that it be marked 9.25.
Yes, uh, that uh, statement can be admitted into evidence as marked nine, Exhibit 9.25. Thank you, Commissioners. I will now read parts of Jamie's statement. When reading these parts of Jamie's statement, I will read them in the first person. I'm a 58-year-old man who has a vision impairment. I am a recipient of the disability support pension, permanently blind. When I was 13 years old, I was involved in an accident. I sustained an acquired brain injury, which prim primarily impacts my vision. I have completed a Bachelor of Behavioural Science, a Master of Human Services, and a Master of Social Work. I have engaged in a number of volunteer work opportunities to develop skills within organisations with the hope of ultimately obtaining paid employment in the social services sector. My volunteering experience spans over 20 years. Despite my experience gained during these volunteer positions and how much I would succeed in these positions, I would make numerous applications for paid employment with these organisations, but I was never successful. I would, however, be kept on as a volunteer within these same organisations. I have also interacted with several disability employment services or DES providers. Based on my experience with these DES providers, I believe it is a broken system without adequate resourcing available to properly assist people with disability to obtain meaningful employment. There appears to be a lack of accountability. During the approximately 30 years of my engagement with DES providers, I was offered an estimated six employment opportunities by DES providers. I was also never asked to provide a copy of my degrees. Prior to commencing tertiary education, I had over seven years of significant paid employment as a clerical assistant in both the public and private sectors. I took and scored highly in the public service test to enter the public service. My first paid employment since completing my tertiary education and in over 27 years was in mid-2019 at an Australian disability enterprise. At one particular ADE, I was paid approximately $120 per fortnight due to a wage assessment. I was paid an hourly rate of $3.51. This amount is significantly lower than the minimum wage of $19.84, which was current as at 1 July 2020. For me, this amount of income is not nearly enough to cover the necessities such as rent or mortgage repayments, bills and other essential groceries or personal items. Based on my experiences with employment at ADEs, I believe that the law does not adequately protect people with disabilities from exploitation in workplaces, nor does it ensure that people with a disability are paid a fair wage. There is a need for a person-centred approach to employment for people with disability. When people with disability wish to obtain employment, it is imperative that their skills, knowledge, experience and level of education are taken into account. Commissioners, I would like to also tender the statement of Deborah Fullwood. You will find a copy of Ms Fullwood's statement in Tender Bundle Part A at tab 49. I ask that Ms Fullwood's statement be tendered into evidence and that it be marked Exhibit 9.26. Yes, that can be done. Commissioner, Deborah Fullwood is Rowan Fullwood's mother. You may recall that Rowan was our first witness for this hearing 
who gave evidence on Monday morning about his experiences in employment, which included approximately 18 years at McDonald's. In providing her statement, Ms. Forward wants to make the Commission under, understand some of the underpinnings that have supported Rowan's success and the institutional and bureaucratic barriers that have hampered Rowan's success and continue to do so. Ms. Forward's statement details issues encountered by Rowan and his parents in relation to Centrelink income reporting obligations and the treatment of financial contributions provided by Rowan's parents. At paragraph 13 of her statement, Ms. Fullwood describes the system of reporting income to Centrelink is a complicated and difficult process and something that Rowan is unable to do alone. Ms. Fullwood details the support provided to Rowan, particularly by Rowan's father, in reporting Rowan's income to Centrelink every fortnight for the last 20 years. Ms. Fulwood's view is that the system of reporting income to Centrelink in its current form is a real barrier to people like Rowan maintaining employment. Within her statement, Ms. Fulwood acknowledges that stable housing is a major factor which has impacted positively on Rowan's life. The provision of stable housing is something that has allowed Rowan to become familiar with his local stores and their employees, his regular travel routes and his fellow commuters. These familiar local touch points have helped to facilitate Rowan's long-term employment and keep him safe. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Commissioners, our next witness, as you can see on the screen, uh, are collectively Get Skilled Access, which is an organisation founded in 2017 by Dylan Alcott and Nick Morris. And we've asked um, some of the members of Get Skilled Access to come and talk to us about their work and their experience of people with disability seeking employment. So I think we first need to just deal with some oaths and affirmations. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much for coming to the Commission to give evidence today. We very much appreciate your attendance. If you would be good enough uh, to follow the instructions of my associate who will administer the oath or the affirmation as the case may be. Thank you. Firstly, I will read the affirmation. I will read you both the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. And Ms Agnew, I will now read the oath. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Now, Ms Eastman will ask you some questions. Now, Commissioners, you have a, a joint statement, but what I first um, might do is start with uh, each member of the panel and introduce them and ask them a little bit about what their role is with GSA. So, uh, Stephanie, can I start with you? You are Stephanie Agnew. Yes, that is correct. And what is your role at GSA? I am the operations assistant at Get Skilled Access. And what does that role involve? Uh, it involves uh, organising some of our work with clients. I also do delivery to our clients, um, delivering training and also liaising with our associates. So we have quite a large uh, number of associates with disability and I uh, assign them work and also um, assist in any issues that they may have. Okay. Now, next to you in the middle is Zach. So you are Zach Alcott? Correct. And what do you do at GSA? 
What do I do? Um, get yelled at by Steph a lot. <laughs> no, uh, I'm the uh, senior engagement consultant. Um, so I guess that means I wear a lot of hats. Uh, so I work on uh, new clients, uh, current clients, on both uh, project development, project delivery, uh, consulting. Uh, I also assist in the delivery of training um, and, and implementations. Uh, I run our uh, Disability Inclusion Action Plan Department, um, as well as a lot of work in the uh, events industry space. And, and Danny, Danny Fralin, um, what is your role at GSA? Uh, so my role is I am the COO. I'm also a uh, part owner of the business. Uh, and so my role entails um, pretty much a lot of things mm. that are, <laughs> are centred around consulting. So um, I project manage our largest project, uh, Sport for All. Um, we I do a lot of the tender writing, a lot of business development, uh, a lot of work with other government committees. So sit on the COVID-19 uh, government committee for people with disabilities and the disability employment uh, action committee so um, have a wide range of roles and uh, support the organization to grow substantially and collectively you've prepared a statement for the royal commission and can we take it that what you've said in the statement collectively is true yes yes but I like the nod of all three. Um, on that basis, commissioners, could you receive into evidence the joint statement of market exhibit 9.27? Yes, that can be done. Now, you've told the Royal Commission that GSA is, quote, a for-profit, for-purpose organisation, which works with clients to provide real-life, tangible, emotional experiences that drive inclusion, productivity and profitability. So this is an organisation founded in 2017. Why was GSA founded? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so uh, you might not have picked up before, but Dylan is my little brother. So um, Who, who's Dylan Orcott? Yeah, so Dylan Orcott is Paralympian, <laughs> triple gold medalist, uh, I think 11 time grandstand uh, winner, he's won a Logie. He's my little brother and my parents' number one son. But uh, Dylan, Dylan approached uh, myself and uh, our father and said, I want to make disability sexy. Now, I feel creepy saying that, so I say contemporary. But he felt that the disability space was viewed and spoken about very medical model of disability. He, in his words, old, dusty, Zimmer frame. And this is how both people spoke about disability, but disability was viewed. And that's not how he perceived either himself or the disability community. And he wanted to, he said, why can't we talk about the productivity of people with disability when they're employed or the great um, retention rates or less sick days that they take because they make such great employees. And then on the flip side, why can't we talk about what great customers or what a great business opportunity is to have an accessible organisation uh, or an accessible public sector where community involvement is a lot higher. So with all of that said, um, we started GSA as a real disruptor model of uh, consulting to, as I said, organisations, both private and government, to better help them understand disability, whether it be from an employment standpoint, a stakeholder standpoint, community engagement standpoint, or customer service standpoint. And one final thing that Dylan and our whole organisation is really passionate about is he was sick of able-bodied people speaking to able-bodied people around what people with disability needed. He has come across and experienced, and I'm sure a lot of people with disability have experienced this their whole life. So with that being said, um, our organisation, uh, we have around 30 staff, um, all of us, uh, well, uh, there's 24, 25 of us that have disability uh, and then uh, the ones of us that don't have a disability all have a lived connection to disability. So disability is uh, at the front of everything that we do. So Oliver Hunter, um, who yes. Yes. <laughs> this week, uh, gave us a little window into his experience of working with you and also we had a bit of a discussion about music festivals and wheelchair surfing. 
Yep. But Danny, can I ask you, uh, what is the business model and what's different about the business model for GSA to other organisations? Uh, so, the, is the model different? There are probably many business models that are similar. Um, however, our fundamental principles is that, uh, along the lines that Zach spoke about. Um, so, we run an associate model for our business predominantly. And one of the reasons why we run an associate model in a sort of consulting business model framework is because we want to give our people, our associates, as much flexibility as possible in the way they choose to work, when they choose to work, the other work that they might um, want to do as part of their, their careers outside of, of GSA. Um, and so it's a really important piece of the puzzle for us. Um, we're also a startup, so, you know, we can't suddenly employ... Um, so many people. I'm ex-PWC, so having uh, a huge number of consultants has a significant financial burden on the organisation. So as a startup, we also bring people in as, on an as-needs basis. And because we span, so, so all of our associates have disability, we don't specialise in a particular type of disability. We actually cover as many disabilities in our associates as, as possible, including lived experience. I have a son with disability. Um, and, and I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle that we want to employ more people with disability. In fact, we're always looking for more associates. Um, and they can work in and the way that is most appropriate for who they are and what their lifestyle is. Uh, and that's a really important piece of the puzzle. I think the other part of our business model, and is it part of our business model, I'm not sure, um, we know who is a GSA person because they want to challenge the system and they want to, um, they're typically younger, I'm the oldest person in the business, um, and they're typically younger and we really want to change um, society through uh, people of another generation coming through and saying, this is how we want to live our lives, which is a really important piece, I think. So, so Steph, the, one of the fundamental business principles of GSA is that when disability is being discussed at the table, a person with disability should have a seat at the table. From your perspective, why is that uh, a fundamental business principle? Absolutely. So I am completely blind to myself. I was diagnosed at the age of 19 with a degenerative eye condition and then I now navigate with a guide dog. And it's so important that we get to say as a person with disability what will help us or, um, and not have people assume uh, what we need or what we might require and be able to have voices ourselves and have the choice and control to be able to do that. <clears throat> Now, one, one task that you took on fairly early on in the business was the design of what you call an inclusive culture assessment tool. And I want to ask you about uh, this tool, how it was designed, and then what's come out of that process. So who would like to tackle that question? Definitely Danny. <laughs> yes, this is where they, yeah. I get the, uh, the yeah. look on my handball. Yeah. <laughs> I will try to make sure that we do this all evenly. So, <laughs> Danny, if you answer all the questions, I'm going to have to come back and... No, 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 I don't want to answer all the questions, but yeah. this is my yeah. area of expertise. You're one. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Sorry. Culture's Danny. Yeah. Well, I'll do some work later. Um, so, and I think it's important to think about why we decided this was a, a tool that needed to be created. So, um, my background is in culture leadership uh, organisational um, change and uh, coming into the business as I did I think it was 18 months old but I came into the business uh, GSA was doing a whole lot of really great stuff around um, immersive experiences about around training for people uh, but one of the fundamental questions in uh, being employed in an organisation is do you or do you not fit the culture and that's for anybody and, and um, able-bodied dis people with disability, whatever, whoever it is, is do I fit the culture? And what became quite clear to me is that um, what we were seeing was that even though we were doing quite a lot of work with an organisation, they may not have an inclusive culture overall, in which case a person with disability might have all of the um, technical aspects of their needs looked after. So um, they might have the... Uh, What's the word? Workplace, adjustments. workplace adjustments or other things taken care of 
but look, they might take a long time. People might be a bit sort of funny about having to employ somebody and put those in. Uh, and then we were hearing a lot about people with disability not feeling like they fitted necessarily. And so this whole idea of how, how can a culture be more inclusive of disability and what were the elements was sort of, we discussed mm. as a team. Um, and so sort of rooted in the fundamental aspects of what culture is, which in the principles of culture being that it's um, behavioural, um, it's around behaviours and beliefs, systems and processes and symbols that people see. Um, we then went out to a huge number of people with disability and said, what does an inclusive culture look like to you? And what are the elements? And then we distilled those down into what we call the, the um, seven values of inclusion. Um, we developed an assessment tool, so a survey tool that we use. Um, and we trialled this a number of times to ensure that we were actually um, getting the answers and looking at the culture as, it, as we anticipated it should have, um, the results should have come back with. And then we did a very large piece of work with the Department of Education in Queensland. Um, and that piece of work helped to really distill this particular uh, tool, which we now use across uh, the vast majority of our clients um, to understand those elements of, of culture. It's very difficult to measure um, unconscious bias. I would say it's impossible to measure unconscious bias, but what you can do is understand what are the beliefs, behaviours, systems and processes that an organisation has that makes it inclusive or not. So it's sort of it's easy to say, oh, we're inclusive and we commit to inclusion and it's a really good idea. But it's another thing to translate those words into deeds. Absolutely. And so the starting point is really coming back to core values of an organization. And I've got to put up on the screen, I hope that you can see this. You've included in this in your statement, Commissioner, this is paragraph 13, if it assists, these core values. And I just want to ask you about how these came about. As I understand it, you did the, a very significant survey uh, with lots of questions. And then this was the distillation of what came out of the, the survey and the consultation process. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. All right. Now, looking at these, uh, you've got, uh, we've got a number of dot points there. I mean, on one view, I'd say these sort of seem like the obvious. <laughs> uh, but obviously there was a process to get to the identification of these values that help build inclusive cultures. Um, em empathy, I mean, how do you help people understand or feel what another person is experiencing within that frame of reference? So again, I'm just trying to understand how you start to translate these values and the words into deed or action. Well, let me help you here. I'm actually going to get um, Zach and or Steph to talk about our immersive experiences because I think empathy sits mm. uh, very well in what people understand and learn from those. Sure, I'll kick it off. And then, uh, and then move it over to Steph, I guess, from her experience because she's one of the uh, associates part of it. But for the uh, immersive experiences, so we, we do this uh, when we first start working with an organisation. Um, specifically large-scale organisations where we work with the senior leadership team uh, to help them better understand disability. And how we do it is we actually, uh, whether it's um, at a customer service, uh, let's say a supermarket, or if it's within an office, they we run three-hour sessions with the senior leadership team and they experience what it's like to have a disability within their workplace or their... How do you do that? Yeah, so we do it by having, as I said, the associates. So we have um, a whole team of associates covering across uh, wheelchair users, low vision blind, uh, intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum, uh, neurodiverse. Um, I, I know I'm going to leave one out, but it's very broad. Here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very broad. And the senior leaders will be paired off with uh, those um, associates individually. And the, for example, Dylan, who is in a wheelchair, will be partnered with the CEO. The CEO jumps in a wheelchair and then he goes and tries, or she goes and tries to shop with Dylan and actually experience what it's like to try to get something off the top shelf or what it's like to navigate around their office space when they try to have to get, try to get to the printer. Um, Steph, you, you've been part of these immersive experiences. Do you want to explain a little bit, I guess, from your part of it? Um, 
you know, the interactions with these senior leaders? Yes, yeah, so I, it's extremely powerful. Um, so my role, obviously being blind, I, we're able to either blindfold or give these senior leaders uh, frosted glasses. So they, they either have low vision or complete blindness and they're given a white cane. <laughs> And I give them a little bit of a demonstration of, of how to use it. And we walk around that uh, organisation or uh, the venue that, that they want to experience. And they experience pretty much what I experience as a person with either low vision or blindness. And it really helps them to walk in our shoes and think about things differently and really think about uh, accessibility and inclusion within their organisation. And just to kind of, I guess, wrap it up as well, it's really great for a few reasons around we create a really safe space. So these senior leaders, and the reason why we obviously do it with the senior leaders is they can have the most influence throughout such a large organisation. They point the ship in the direction um, on a whole different, different ways, whether it be budget, culture, um, employment, etc. And to create this safe space, sometimes um, there's senior leaders that have actually never met someone or spoken to someone with a disability. So this is a really great way for them to both ask questions in a safe environment. Um, as Danny said, there's a certain type of GSA person. You know, we're very opening, welcoming. Uh, we call people in, not people out. So they can have those really, uh, you know, what they, the senior leaders might think is a silly question isn't. It's actually a great question because you're learning about disability. So there's that side of it. But also what you, which is really cool is they're actually on the job, like live problem solving. So mm. when we talk about the access or the design for something, you know, if the, the, the property manager or the, the head of, um, you know, the office space or whatever in these sessions, like, well, if I just change this slightly, would this actually make it easier for you to come to work? And the answer is yes. And they have witnessed firsthand and experienced what such small changes or what might seem as a small change can make such a large impact for a um, person with disability, whether it be, as I said, to get a job or work within an organisation or to use the organisation's services independently. So, yeah, so building on that empathy sort of starts to factor into the other core values. So Zach has just said, that capacity to see a problem and solve it, that reflects that value of openness. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And then curiosity. Uh, why would curiosity be a core <laughs> in terms of inclusive tools? That is a great question. Um, and the answer is in a conversation we've just had just prior to um, coming into this session uh, with a group with our team. We, and Dylan puts it beautifully, he said just because he's in a wheelchair doesn't mean he knows everything about every other type of disability. In fact, he doesn't. And uh, he gets asked on uh, for his gold medals, um, what does the Braille say? And he said, well, I don't know, I can only guess because I don't read Braille. Um, and so even before, even before you meet somebody with disability, for the first time, often people are really too scared, as Zach said, to ask questions. And to say, to say, what is what is it you need? How would you like me to speak to you? What are the things that are appropriate? The conversation we were having just before was, um, is it a person with disability? Is it a disabled person? And there are many, you know, different sets of thinking around just that piece of language. Neither is right or wrong. It just, you need to understand what that person wants. And I think what often happens with disability is it gets lumped into this well, here's a person with disability and so we can do this, we can't do that. Whereas actually it's about asking the questions. If your organisation is not a curious organisation, then um, naturally in its culture and it's a telling organisation, then that is a very, very difficult culture to bring somebody with disability in because the person um, will not have the opportunity to share what is important to them. Now that's the same as somebody without disability, but even more so the case with somebody with disability. So looking at each of the seven values, I'd step back and say these are not necessarily disability specific, are they? No. Uh, so not. these are values that may reflect inclusive cultures across the board, regardless of disability or other characteristics. So what is it about these seven uh, values 
that you think start to make a difference in building inclusive cultures for people with disability? Uh, well, some of the, it's a really good question. We actually had a training session yesterday as with all our associates in the organisation on the LGBTIQI A+. a, a plus. And, um, and what was fascinating was at the end of it, we all said the sort of things that we need to be aware of um, for inclusion um, from that perspective is basically the same sort of things that organisations need to be aware of for inclusive for disability. Um, the di so the fundamental principles of the values are not necessarily different to any organisation. Um, what is different is that in the survey we have the questions are very much designed with a disability lens on them and so some are quite specific about um, you know, access, some uh, inclusive design, um, you know, uh, so the more technical aspects mm. of disability. Um, and some of them, for example, like accountability gets into the sort of process of, um, which some people fi might find difficult, uh, which is potentially coaching a person with disability or putting a person with disability onto performance management or, you know, so there are, certain or recruitment mm -hmm. is a really big piece of the puzzle how do you have a recruitment team that actually um, has these values front and center and does it in a way for example instead of saying asking a person coming in for a job uh, have you got a disability and them having to fill that out which is horrendous and most of our team would say i've never touched that i would never answer those questions is asking a question like um, what is it that we could do for you that is going to make your interview successful yeah. for anybody who's going for that role? Mm. So, so we're trying to, whilst being specific in, in uh, creating an inclusive environment for people with disability, actually do it in a way that everybody benefits and it doesn't become this sort of, we have to do this to the side. Mm. As soon as it becomes something that we have to do this or it's going to cost more money or you know, it's going to take more time, then people will be less likely to do it. Uh, so we're trying to put it into the context of the whole organisation's success. Right. So what, I want to move um, to some of the particular initiatives that you've tried with organisations in Australia to build on these inclusive cultures. And we've asked you when preparing the statement not to identify any particular clients by name and so you've described your clients uh, as 56 different organizations covering a wide range of industries and areas within Australia and they range from small to medium enterprises up to ASX top 50 and so the, pro the your process is that the client comes to you and uh, for the most part you've got a mixture of both private and public sector is that right? Yeah, I think they either come to us or we approach them. It depends. Um, I think in a potential government standpoint, it's a, it's probably a bit more of a two-way street um, where we would approach departments with uh, ideas uh, or, or thoughts of how they have programs that might be implemented. Um, and then in the private side of things, uh, I'd still say it's probably 60-40 60 people coming to us, 40 us making connections and getting introduced to organisations. Um, there is a real changing, I think, of the tides. Um, organisations, I think just by you listed there, saying the uh, sheer amount of organisations, but also the real diverse mix of industries shows that it's not just potentially healthcare or the Department of Social Services interested in, in disability. It's really broad from live music to events to um, uh, sports organisations. Um, and then in regards to the mix, we tried to figure out the other, other day, 70% government, 30% private? Uh, yeah, roughly, yeah. So the clients come for quite a range of reasons. They may need assistance with inclusive strategies and building inclusive cultures uh, or developing particular programs. But you also have clients who come to you for advice on disability inclusion action plans 
and also accessibility audits. And we heard a little bit about action plans over the course of the past few days, and we've just had the Disability Discrimination Commissioner, whose job it is to do work around action plans. Yep. So can I can I perhaps just go directly to the action plan? So Zach, this is something that you do. And right. I see some apprehension about action plans because you can put a lot of energy into drafting an action plan. It looks good and you've got a glossy brochure and you have a morning tea and it's fabulous. And then two years later, somebody goes, do we have an action plan? <laughs> so I'm interested in, in, it's one thing to draft, it's another to implement. What, and I know you've only been going at this for a number of years, but what's been your experience in drafting action plans that actually work? Yeah, first of all, I completely agree with you, the old nice shiny, here's the document, and it lives in the drawer of the one person that wrote it uh, for, for large organisations. And that was really the common conversation or feedback we were getting when we first started the organisation. We talked to businesses and say, yeah, we've got an action plan. We had it for three years. It's about to expire. I wrote it. No one else really knows about it. And it really kind of got us thinking um, around the faults around it. And for a plan to work from creation to implementation across the, uh, whether it be two, three or four years of the plan, it's really important to both uh, bring, engage senior leadership uh, in the process of creating the plan, spreading the reach as far as you can when we are talking or when we're doing running discovery sessions. So we run discovery sessions um, with every department and try to get as many senior leader or key stakeholders that will be a part of this plan. And I think probably I did miss a step. It's really crucial to understand the business. So we're coming in consulting to these organisations and it's not a, and this is, I guess, at the heart of GSA on a whole is actually understanding the business before telling them what to do when it comes to disability and inclusion. Because um, you only make, you know, one chance to make a first impression when we are implementing um, disability uh, projects, training, plans, whatever. And I think if you miss the mark, it can come across a bit tokenistic, tick box, yep, we're doing this because we have to and move on. Whereas if you understand the business, if you bring as many people in to the program, um, I think you're just setting yourself up for success. So when we're drafting these plans and when we're at the draft stage and we socialise the plan, we've already, and, and, and we've run discovery sessions with, you know, it could be myself in the room and three of our associates with different disabilities. And it's the same almost to the immersive experience. The senior leaders are kind of asking like, oh, what's it like to get a job? Because they're both learning, but they're also contributing on how this plan is going to be successful and what the goals are going to be. They're ultimately helping us write these goals. And then when we socialise the report for the first time, they've got to be comfortable with them, but there's no shock. It's not like we've dropped a draft on their decks and said, congratulations, um, head of HR, you're now going to employ 100 people with disability over the next three years. They've actually been along the whole time. And then there's just that level of confidence and that buy-in across all departments. So it's not just people in culture with a plan trying to, you know, engage marketing, try to engage sales, trying to engage all these different departments. And they're like, you know, get stuff. Like I've got enough on my plate. They know about it. They have worked on it. So that's that side of it. And then the next, I guess, uh, for it to be sustainable and for the longevity of it is to understand what it's going to cost and what needs to be done to achieve these goals because it's easy to write the goals down and they're as you said great words on a page and you know you get a you get a you you do a morning tea but it can't end there so what's it going to what's it going to take to actually achieve you one goal write it into the budget what 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 resources do we have and what we do is we work with the organization and say all right for this um, year one goal for employment. We need to look at doing a recruitment review. We'll train up staff. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll create inclusive guidelines and it will um, take X amount of hours at X amount of price. And then that's built into the year plan. And then we build out a project plan. I was speaking to one of our clients um, actually last week about we, we've had a really great uh, year 
believe it or not, in COVID nineteen with one of our uh, with one of our clients that launched a plan uh, in December, uh, International Day of People with Disability last year, uh, and have achieved every goal that they set out to do within the year, and that's huge in COVID. Like in in, in, in within the year that we've had, mm. it's a real testament to them to their level of commitment. And I kind of asked them, like, you know, what? Why didn't you kind of just put it in the too hard basket? And they said that a few things. One, they were comfortable delivering them because we set everything in the structure. Um, we worked with them end to end. So we were always working with them touch points so they knew that they could achieve the goals because we were there supporting them. And there was an element of both flexibility and actually openness to the sense where they can speak to us and let us know that actually we're going to struggle to get this done right now, but they felt comfortable actually saying it versus um, potentially other um, when they, they felt that potentially like, oh, if, if we didn't feel comfortable with this, they might just stick their head in the sand and say, oh, I don't want to talk about a failure and disability because I feel like I've let someone down or I'm discriminating when instead they said, hey, we need to either work harder on this or this might be a one and a half year goal compared to just ignoring it. So, yeah. And then obviously that year on process repeats itself <laughs> year on year until the end of the, uh, the plan. And then just finally, just celebrating, celebrating the good work. Um, organizations on a whole can get a lot better at actually talking about the good things that they're doing in this space. Uh, a lot of the times people are doing good things, but they don't talk about it and it's almost up for, people with disability just to stumble over it. Yeah. And do they, uh, I mean, it's early days and often uh, action plans take a while, not always being able to be achieved, say, in one year. But do you have a role in coming back and building in the accountability and the auditing of how successful an action plan actually is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess being part of working with them the whole time, is that so it's the regular check-in so like we for these organizations will have monthly almost like governance meetings where we catch up with them and talk about how it's progressing what are the outcomes um have been could be and i think that's probably a reflection on our work on a whole and um, i know danny's going to jump in again soon but around reporting and actually getting that really rich data and information because I guess when we talk about this space, there can be a lot of like, oh yeah, we did this, we felt really good. And then potentially no one got a single job out of it or um, mm -hmm. people with disability didn't use the product more or whatever. So we're really passionate about actually being held accountable of what we've done with an organization. And that's shown by the results. Um, I was just gonna say, Steph, it would be interesting for you to jump in here um, around all of our clients start from a different base level. Mm. And I think that's really important to think about from a diet. Isn't that right, Steph? If you mm. give an example of some of the clients that we've, from a, you know, sort of had never, and this particular client that Zach's talking about really hadn't had, hadn't employed anybody with disability before, had had no experience with somebody with disability. So their diet was very different to somebody who had, you know, been doing work on this for some time. Yeah, I suppose it comes down to you, that if you're at that very new level, some people have never interacted with a person with disability and they have uh, this fear about speaking to somebody with disability. And I think that's a really important part of GSA is having um, people with disability delivering um, delivering our uh, clients their, their diets or the training that we're doing and really helping them to feel comfortable. I think that's such a, a big thing. And I know uh, for me, speaking to some clients, some people are, are shocked. Like they'll say, oh, well, how, how do you send me an email? How do, how do you do that? And I get the opportunity to explain and say, well, I have a screen reader. This is how it works. And I sometimes even um, will screen record it so that they can, um, they can see how it works. And it gives them that understanding and they realise that, it's not actually um, that scary to talk to someone with a disability um, because it's not at all. It's, um, it's normalising it. And once they sort of um, have that, they can really get involved um, 
and see the changes that are made and see that people with disability can be really successful and they want that in their business. In the joint statement that you've done, you've identified barriers that people with disability have identified for seeking, maintaining and progressing in employment. That's paragraph 18. Mm -hmm. But you've also identified the barriers that you hear from employers that they see are um, perhaps perceived, be it real or otherwise, barriers to employing people with disability. That's paragraph 21. Um, taking it from both sides, from the perspective of a person with disability, and then on the side of the employer who says, well, we lack understanding, we don't have the resources, there aren't enough candidates, we're concerned about capability and we don't feel equipped. How do you reconcile the, the perception of barriers on both sides? That's a hard question. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing you in yeah. a little bit. Um, Can you solve this whole yeah. question right now? <laughs> exactly. yeah, just answer in two minutes. Yeah. Um, look, I want to give an example, and it probably doesn't quite answer your question, but it may to a point. So um, I went to, before I started working for Get Skilled Access, I went to a job interview and I was asked, how am I going to get to work? And it was uh, an assumption and the way it was said was that because I was blind, I wouldn't be able to come to work. And so how did I expect to get myself from my home to my work? And I wouldn't be suitable, basically. Um, whereas when I had my interview with GSA, I was asked and said, um, do you need any assistance with um, getting to work? Not that that's, that's not the employer's responsibility, but it was that whole different mindset. And it was, it's about, um, I think people can be really scared to ask the questions. I mean, if you're sitting next to a colleague that doesn't have disability, you'll say, oh, you'll just ask a question. But some people get really scared to ask the questions um, to a person with disability, but it's just about you know, making sure that you ask what they need and removing those barriers. And I think um, Zach can speak a little bit about workplace adjustments as well um, and the some of the misconceptions around the costs around those workplace adjustments. Great. Um, so I think before we move on to, I guess, the employer, I think there's probably a couple more around uh, people with disability that's probably worth mentioning, whether it be... Um, lack of positive career counselling from school. So when we get into and I'll use Dylan as an example. Um, Dylan was, oh, I hate to admit it, but he's a very clever boy, um, but was uh, excelling at school and, you know, had ambitions to uh, get into the corporate world. He always, you know, sport and all of this hasn't always been, you know, his career progression. And he spoke to a counsellor um, and a career counsellor and the career counsellor had nothing for him. And it was almost like, well, just a, dealer, a career had a career yeah. counsellor. Yeah. 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 And, you know, Dylan was, you know, not as cool and handsome as he was now. He was 16 without eyebrows and not that good <laughs> at tennis yet. So don't, don't raise your eyebrows too much, but he, he, he couldn't, he was, wasn't really set up for success. He, he, he did, they didn't say like, all right, mate, you're studying business, you're studying law, you're really good at maths. Here are some options for you to kind of explore. We reckon you can talk, you can definitely talk. Like here are some options for you to, to, to explore where it was almost like, mate, we got nothing for you. Like we don't know. And, and for a young person, that's shattering, especially living with a disability that they're kind of already getting put into a box of like, well, you know, this ceiling's so low for you that we can't have these conversations on what your future looks like when it comes to employment. And can I just add to that, um, my son has intellectual disability and uh, was assessed, so, and, and actually went to a, a special school. Um, and whilst they did some preparation for moving outside of school, there wasn't a great deal. Um, and then, you know, the issue is not only about a complete lack of career counselling, but also when you're assessed for the DSP, the assessment for work capability is done through that same assessment, which is 
uh, firstly, completely inappropriate to have the two assessments uh, for two different purposes. But the second is it's in a, in, in a situation that doesn't help particularly people with intellectual disability to answer successfully or indeed in a way that is focused on their ability to be employed. So as Zach just said, they get put in a box and that box isn't necessarily um, correct for that individual. Um, and then that is sort of where they stay unless you yell and scream like I have done over the years. Um, but there are few people who would be as um, persistent, if you like, on trying to change uh, that system and have the capability to be that way. So I think Zach, what Zach's, the, the, the important piece of the puzzle is the move from school into either, um, and career counselling into either further education, um, some sort of other employment. But as we say over and over again, everybody talks about just getting a job for a person with disability as opposed to what is the career that they would like to pursue? Mm. And if they don't know, well, here's some options and what could you try? So we talk much more around a person with disabilities career rather than just getting them a job, which mm. I think is, is uh, a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, there's, there's so much we you talk about. Can I ask each of you, uh, reflecting back on your time at GSA, what do you sort of see as key initiatives for the future of not only building inclusive cultures, but cultures that will open up employment opportunities for people with disability. And I think one of our witnesses said, we can't all be the extraordinary. We can't all, wait. We can't all be uh, able to achieve at the level that Dylan has achieved. And so how do we make sure that the Dylans of this world um, who have achieved much also pay the way for people who don't ever see themselves as achieving the great heights that your brother has. I'm going to let that slide that you called him extraordinary. <laughs> um, so it's a really valid and fair point. And I think a couple of, a couple of things on that, working with organisations to normalized disability and I don't think well that might have been mentioned throughout uh, this whole week around normalizing disability and uh, taking away the you know oh, you know Steph you're so inspirational by, by coming to work today and dressing yourself and I think if we can normalize just disability and see past that it you know that one in five Australians just are, in, are just seen as another Australian that can that should be able to go to work, should be able to live independently, um, should be able to have their own funds to spend on whatever they want. So I think that's really important. And I think secondly, and I've been reflecting about this the last week or so around um, GSA and our associate model, you know, we have, as Danny and Steph have mentioned, such a diverse range of people that work for us with disability and they're not all Paralympians, they're not all... Um, you know, they're not all uh, keynote speakers and that. And it's one of my pr proudest moments about this or parts about this disability is when organisations start talking about how much they love their associates that they're working with. And it's not just, oh, can Dylan come in and fix disability for mm -hmm. this business? Or can Dylan come and do a keynote and I can get a photo in front of him? You know, these, these they, you know, one of our biggest problems sometimes is, people trying to poach our associates because they're so great. And, you know, I think that is just proves that you don't have to be extraordinary to do extraordinary work or to, um, you know, make, be able, be able to employ and, and do a really, and thrive and do a great job in, in whatever role that you're doing. I think that's a, an excellent note to end on. Uh, thank you very much for your time and the enthusiasm in telling us a little bit about your experience of people with disability finding, maintaining and thriving in employment. Commissioners, that concludes the evidence. Uh, commissioners may have some questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask uh, first uh, Commissioner Galbally whether she has any questions to ask. Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to ask you about um, paragraph 23A, where you talk about the barrier 
of, of increased OC health and safety complications. Um, whether you could sort of speak to that, please. So as in the misconceptions of them? So, yes. Yes. yeah, so I, I think there is probably, and I guess this could be a bit of a blanket across the employment of people with disability of it might potentially be unsafe, it might um, cost additional infrastructure to put in place in order to keep someone with a disability safe within an organisation. You know, in some cases there might be some workplace adjustments that might be uh, done, but there is probably a misconception or a decision made before even interviewing the person with disability. I can, I can give an example. Yeah, go for it. So um, a great example was working with a client and we were talking about recruitment. They had um, a number of sites that were rural and remote. Uh, they actually had a person um, who was a wheelchair user apply for the role uh, and they said to us with great authority that they were actually not going to, um, they didn't pursue with this individual because uh, they felt that the travel would be too much for them and there could be some uh, more medical needs that they might have because they were a wheelchair user and so therefore it would be inappropriate for them to actually uh, um, employ them into that role, having never spoken to the person. So <laughs> there are, and this comes into that whole idea of curiosity, there are so many times where we're given examples of people saying, well, we felt we did the right thing and they did it with good intent, but they actually hadn't realised that having a conversation with that person might actually put paid to any of their concerns. Mm. Um, and some of that was an occupational health and safety and medical, extra medical assumptions. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Atkinson, do you have any questions? No, I just want to thank you for emphasising the strengths of employing people with disability and the importance of not making assumptions. Thank you. And I'll ask Commissioner Ryan. No, thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you very much indeed for giving your evidence uh, and for preparing your statements and also for the work that uh, you are doing. We appreciate your attendance and the contributions to the work of the Royal Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Commissioner, that brings us to our final witness for public hearing nine and uh, Ella Darling, who's here in the hearing room. Just come to the witness table. And she's going to take a deep breath, get some water. No, I'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, Commissioner, if you have a copy of Ella's statement behind uh, tender bundle tab, so part A, tab 16. Yes. Right. And first we have to do the, I think, oath or affirmation. Mm hmm. Do you mind if I call you Ella? Yes. Ella, uh, if you would be please so kind as to follow the instructions of my associate who is next to you over here, oh, hello. and uh, she will administer the affirmation too. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you, Ella. And now Ms Eastman will ask you some questions. Before she does that, on the screen, you can see Commissioner Atkinson, who is in Brisbane, who I think will wave as. Commissioner Galbally is in Melbourne, who has also waved. Commissioner Ryan is next to me, but he doesn't need to wave. And we're <laughs> both in Sydney. All right, let's start. Now, your real name is Pamela Darling. Is that right? Yes but you prefer to be called Ella. Yes, I do. And today, would you like me to call you Ella or Miss Darling? Uh, Miss Darling's good. Miss Darling's good. Right. Now, Miss Darling, you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission. Yes, I have. And you put a lot of work into that statement. Yes. And what you say in the statement is true. Yes. And you've got a copy with you. Yes, I do. So, Commissioners, a copy of the statement, as I said, is behind tab 16. If you could receive that into evidence and mark it as Exhibit 9.28. Yes, that can be done. Thank you. 
So, Miss Darling, can I ask you a few questions about yourself so we can get to know you? Um, sure. So you prefer to be called Ella and you're now 25 years old. Yes. And you live in your own house and that's near you. You have a twin sister. Yes. Okay. Now, you weren't born in Australia. No. What would you like to tell us about where you were born and how did you come to Australia? Well, I was born in Romania and I was adopted when I was five and a half. Um, and, oh, my God. Um, if you want me to jump in at any time. No, no, no. I'm just thinking what I'm about to say. Yeah. yeah. So when I was born in Romania, I was adopted from my um, birth parents and then came to my Australian parents. And, yeah, was, I've lived here for 20 years now, so it's been really good. And you've been to school yes. in Australia? Yes. Now, at the current time, you work for the Council for Intellectual Disability. Yes. And you um, say this is your dream job. Definitely. I think giving a change for people with disability and making a better place, you know. I want people to have jobs like me, go to work every single day, happy, you know, feeling like the same I get appreciated, like thinking, oh, my God, I did something today. I did something well. What's the, best, what's the best bit about the job at CID? You know, meeting new people, talking, you know. I um, did a, a story with, I can't say, but I would did it with one of the doctors and, you know, we just find it interesting about coronavirus, how we can be all aware together, you know, making a better place, you know, for the community, making it good, you know, be safe to all live together, you know, be happy. Yeah. That's something we should all have. So uh, I know you're in the dream job now, but can I go back a little bit to when you're at school? Yes. And ask you when you're at school, what was it like going to school and um, how did you feel about school? Well, I did like school and I did like having my friends and that, but they didn't understand my disability because, you know, it was a required brain injury. So they just assume I couldn't do anything and, you know, they make me do colouring and that wasn't right, you know. Maybe they could have got a you know, a support worker and could have helped me and said, hey, well, we can help you with this. We can instead of just including me and then treating me like I was a baby and I didn't like that. When you were at school, did you get to do any work experience? No, no, I did not. And when you were at school, did anyone talk to you about what you might do when you left school? No, no one really did. And then I finally, when I got out of school, I thought maybe I'll get into a TAFE course or do something interesting which I did for a little bit. Um, and, you know, I got my first job at the cake shop. Yeah. And Tell I, me about the first job at the cake well, shop. How was, did you get that job? Well, actually, it was very interesting. One of the employments gave me a job at the cake shop because they thought, well, you're art and crafty, so I'm really good with my hands mm -hmm. and really good with beading. So you had to do stuff on the cake with that. And, you know, it was very good for a while, for six months, and it, it turned out really well. Unfortunately, that business shut down. So, yeah. So you were doing cake decorating? Yes. And in terms of doing cake decorating, did anybody teach you how to be a good cake decorator? Um, no, we just all went in there, you know, doing the same thing. You know, they taught us that day, okay, this is what we've got to do. But mostly, you know, just chatting and you know doing what we usually do it was really good and how many days a week did you work at the cake shop oh, I think it was like two or three days it wasn't very big but yeah and then one day the shop closed down is that right? yeah they did it shut down because the, the person got sick and yeah okay and what did you do can you remember what you did after the cake decorating job what did you do next <gasps> well mm -hmm. Can I ask you about hairdressing? I think the, the second one was the hairdressing. Yeah. Um, and I really liked that because I did the tape course. I did a cert two in hairdressing and beauty. So I had the skills, I had the, which was really good. And she took the time and energy for that, which I enjoyed. But I think after that, it got too hard for her, you know, because she couldn't pay me the right amount and the money and yeah, got too hard. So how, do you remember how long you worked 
a the year. A year. And then after the year at the hairdressers, she then, let she me go. go. Yeah. And how did you feel about being let go from that job? Oh, I was pretty upset, but you know, that I thought something good might will come out of it, hopefully. And I just thought, okay, let's try something new. And that's how I got into like um, the restaurants. I worked at that, um, which was really good. I worked there for a year. Um, what did you do at the restaurants? You know, cleaning and that, but I could have done more than that. You know, I was capable to do more. And how did you how did you feel about being capable of doing more, but not being asked to do more? Well, I think they didn't understand. I just assumed they just thought, oh, I couldn't do that. So they put me on the floor and, you know, I thought, no, I'll get my certificate in um, Barista and, you know, making the um, teas and coffees and, you know, getting that so I could do that. That was what I wanted to do, but they wouldn't like me because they didn't give me a chance and that was not fair on me. And that job lasted about a year, is yeah. that right? Yes. And then you went to work for another cafe? Yes. And what? tell me about that job. You did, did, did make coffees in that job, didn't you? Uh, no, I was an all-rounder. So I did most things like, you know, work in the kids' play area and like, you know, work in the restaurant, but mostly doing that, yes. And was this a job that on your first day that was okay, but then after that? Yes. The, the boss was not great? Yes. What happened? Uh, they just started being really rude because I couldn't measure properly like the um, the vinegar. And I just said to them, look, I, I can't do the measurements. Can you? And they said, it can't be that bloody hard. And I just thought, well, for me it is because my measuring skills and the number and them wasn't good. And I told the big person, I said, look, I feel like I'm not getting appreciated by this and they were just like well I can't do anything about it it's just like okay but I'm coming to you to help you to help me to what to do next you know they did anyone help you to work out what to do next no and you decided to quit that job after a few weeks uh no they let me go after oh, that. that yes so then um and you've had a desk provider who's helped you find some jobs from time yes. to time and some jobs you've said no to because they wanted you to work for a very small hourly rate yes right? yes so um, another job you got was working in a restaurant and a hotel yes and that was um one where you got by yourself you did your own application yes and you had to go to an interview yes and you got the job yes and how was it actually doing that interview? Did you like the interview? Uh, the interview was pretty good because, you know, we all just chatted, you know, and they said, oh, what do you want in this job? And I just said, well, I'm interested in learning new skills, what I can do. Um, they said, well, all right, well, that's interesting. Well, we'll give you the job, you know, and then I started working there. And then after that, I think after a few weeks, they didn't really give me a chance to do most things. So they just expect me to run around like crazy. And I didn't like that. You know, I wanted to do one thing at a time so I could go over that. But they wouldn't. They just would not. No, you're doing an all round. That's what we're doing. And that's final. <laughs> and, um, and was this a job where some of the people working there were a little bit rude to you? Yes. And how did that make you feel? I mean, it didn't make me feel nice. I mean, I would rather someone that treat me respectfully, you know, be like, yep, here you go, Ella, this is what we're going to do. Hopefully you can do this or not. I can get you more help or more, you know. So, yes. And um, when you were doing that job, if someone was being rude to you, did, did anyone help you sort out those problems or help you talk to the person? No, I pretty much uh, told my advisor I'm having difficulties and they said, well, you're, well, you got the job and you've got to do it yourself. It's your responsibility. And I said, yes, I understand that, but we're having not an agreement with each other. So, you know, and, you know, the even the advisor didn't help me. And I just thought, well, you know, I'll rather just do it myself. And and I just told them, you know, you guys are not treating me respectfully and I just feel like you're not including me in things, you know. So, yeah. So, that, so you left that job after about six months. Yes, yeah. yes, I did. The next job you got was working in a retail shop. And yes. you got that job 
yourself because yes. you went into the shop and what did you say have you got any jobs um i just yeah. said is there a job any available yeah. and uh the guy said yes we're looking for someone i said that's great i'm willing to work hard and he said all right can you start straight away i said all right then so i was really excited yeah. and um I really liked job that for a, bit, a little bit because I was like doing stacking shelves, you know, tying up, you know, doing another skill that we can all do. Um, but, you know, in general, I thought that would be a good job for me mm. until I got bullied by that person and she was quite horrible on the mm. second day. She's like, what are you doing here? I don't expect you to be here. I'm just like, well, your boss gave me the job oh, well, I'm giving him a call then. I'm just like, um, okay, then you can call him. But, you know, and she made it really difficult mm-hmm. and embarrassing too. You, you, she called you names, didn't she, yeah. on this job? And that made you feel really... Yeah, like one time I was in the sh- stacking another shelf and then she was talking about me to a, another person behind my back and I could hear the whole conversation pretty much. But I did nothing to do. I just kept my head high and just thought, wow, you're, you know... You must be really low to do that, you know. So, yeah. But you stuck at this job for about six months and then that shop closed. And yes. You lost your job again. Yes. All right. So you've done actually lots of different jobs. Yes, I have. And in terms of when you've had the jobs, what's worked for you in getting getting a job and keeping in a job? Well, I think now this job I have at, for CID has been really good you know um you know it's it's been achieving like goals what I've, I want to reach you know like I've always wanted to be a speaker you know I've done that um I've always you know wanted to help people with disability achieve their goals you know and I've done that you know and like just doing something new and to learn skills you know that's what I want so you've worked for a CID now for two years yes and some of the projects that you've done. Mainstream and me, yeah. um, more than just a job. Um, we're doing more than just a job again because we got some funding, which is good. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's been really good. And you help people during COVID-19. Yes. And what did you do around COVID-19 <sighs> to help people understand uh, a little bit more about COVID-19? Um, well, we did the health website. Uh, web- website. Um, and we did like the photo shoot. This will happen if you don't take care of yourself. Um, we did some over talking. We uh, did a lot of um, voice recording. There's videos if you guys want to see it. Um, and, you know, we're just talking about being safe, being aware, um, making sure with people with intellectual disability or in general with any disability, just to be aware that you guys to be safe and, you know, even when, we had, we would try and say to the support people too about making sure you all guys know too because they might have support workers that might come in and they might not know and be like, oh, okay, well, this is what we do. So we made a plan list too. To help everybody yes. have a better understanding. Yes. All right, the last things I'm going to ask you about is you've made some recommendations in your statements. Yes. So if you turn to the second, the last page and the second last page. So what's which? So it's got a heading. It says recommendations number thirty six. Yep, number thirty six. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you don't have to read out the recommendations, yeah. and I know that you have the recommendations in your head. So the final thing I want to ask you today is: Can you tell us what are your recommendations that you think will help uh, other people with disability have the opportunity to have a job? I think is to give them a chance, give them a go. Don't treat us like we can't do anything when we can. We'll give it more 100%. And I feel like, you know, we're all the same pretty much. You know, they might be a bit slower, but we're all pretty much all the same. And, yeah, I think, you know, give us a go. So what about employers? What could they do? Well, we can teach them about some training so we can train them, like, you know, on the job, what if someone with a disability or any disability could have one day of training and we're like, all right, this day is going to be training and this is how we're going to treat this person with a disability to be included 
and make sure that they're going to feel like they've want, wandered in this workplace. What about having easy read policies? Yeah, easy reads, documents, you know, flyers, you know, all word of mouth like Facebook, Instagram, all of that. We could do definitely do that. And is it important that employers ask people with disability what they need and what they want? Yes, I think it's always better to ask someone than not because they might feel have a difficult day and they're like, oh, well, I don't know what to do. They're like, well, here's this is what we're going to do. At 10 o'clock, we're going to do this. At 11 o'clock, I'm going to treat you more about this, how we're going to do that and, and how you feel. And they'll be like, all right, cool, you know, it's good. Um, Ms. Darling, thank you so much for coming and sharing all of the different jobs and your experience of work with the Royal Commission. We're very pleased to have you and thank you for being our final witnesses. Oh, thank you so much again. Some of the commissions might have some questions for you, so I'll just check with them before we finish. Yes, I'll just check with the other commissioners. I'll first ask Commissioner Galbally, who is in Melbourne, who's on the screen. Hello, look, thank you very much um, for your evidence. I just uh, noted through your statement that you stuck up for yourself about getting paid a proper wage and you refused to work in an ADE because it was $2.50 an hour. Can you yes. talk a little bit more about that? Well, they wanted me to work in a shelter home and I just thought, nah, I'm more capable to more skills. and. Um, that job employment agency wanted me to do that because they couldn't find a normal job for me. So they just thought sticking me in a, you know, group home, shelter home where that they thought $2.50 or $3 an hour is enough. And I thought, well, that's not good enough. I need more. I basically can do more than that. You know, I may have an intellectual disability, but I, I'm not, you know, not, not function. I can't, I can function well enough to do that, you know, and they thought, well, no, you can't, you know, because of that, you know. And I just thought that, well, that's completely wrong. Thank you. I'll ask Commissioner Atkinson now. Uh, no. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask Commissioner Ryan. Um, um, Ella, there's one question I wanted to ask you. Um, in your recommendation, you said that disability employment services should use easy read or pictures. Have you dealt with a disability employment service that hasn't made? Uh, not yet, but we, we're wanting to do that. We want to go to the employers or uh, DES or anyone who wants to do the easy read so we can do it for them, you know, so that's what we want but, to do. But what I was trying to understand is you engaged with disability employment services who have not used easy read documentation. So would that be right? Yes. Wow. Well, thank you for telling us that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for coming to our Sydney hearing room to give evidence today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you for your statement. And uh, as Ms Eastman said, thank you for taking us through your very interesting employment history. We wish you every success uh, in your current role. Thank you so much. Which you obviously enjoy enormously. So all the best for that. Thank you. Um, so commissioners, that concludes the evidence. I think, um, uh, Chair, you want to make some closing remarks and there's some directions, but we might adjourn for lunch yes. and then return in an hour just to close the hearing. Yes, the, any remarks would be brief, but uh, it might be convenient. I think if, if we could come back, let us say, at, uh, where are we now, 2.35 uh, uh, Sydney time, 1.35 Brisbane time. Thank you. We'll resume. Thank you. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Mm -hmm. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, as I mentioned before lunch, we concluded the evidence for this public hearing with the evidence from Ms. Darling. Can I say something just by way of closing remarks before, Chair, you give some closing remarks and some directions? As I said in the Council Assisting Opening Remarks on Monday, the focus of this hearing this week has very deliberately been directed to the experiences of people with disability. 
we have heard from people living with disability about their experiences in finding, maintaining, progressing and leaving jobs in the open labour market. In this hearing, we did not hear from employers, employer-employee representative bodies or governments. However, our focus cannot and will not be one-sided. And further, as I said in my opening remarks, simply identifying a list of systemic barriers is not enough. The Royal Commission will need to examine how these barriers can be addressed and ideally eliminated. This hearing, therefore, has been the first part of our examination into the barriers to open employment for people with disability. In the second part of our examination of this issue, we will turn our attention specifically to the measures and actions of employers, unions, service providers, representative bodies and governments in addressing the systemic barriers to eliminate violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability in employment. In that respect, we will explore the systems, laws, policies, programs and processes relevant to the pathways and barriers to open employment for people with disability. This will necessarily involve a closer examination of the regulation of both private and public sector employers, together with governments and the institutions responsible for the regulation of employment and the labour market in Australia. We intend at a future time to hear from governments, employers, service providers and others. In preparation for that further hearing, we will be seeking directions today to set aside a date for oral submissions early next year to consider the proposed scope for the Royal Commission's further inquiry into the themes and issues identified in public hearing nine. Any recommendations that the commissioners may make in relation to barriers to employment for people with disability will be based on both this hearing and the future hearings, and we'll take those areas together with respect to any proposed recommendations that we make to the commissioners. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms Eastman. <clears throat> I would like to make some brief uh, closing remarks. First and most importantly, I would like to express the deep appreciation of the commissioners to the witnesses with disability who have shared their experiences with us so frankly and openly this week. It's not easy to give evidence at a public hearing about the formidable and sometimes insurmountable challenges that people with disability face when they seek to participate to the fullest possible extent in the labour force. We are most grateful to each of the witnesses who have given evidence this week. As we were reminded earlier in the week, Article 27 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities obliges states parties to recognise the, the right of persons with disability to work on an equal basis with others. This includes the right to the opportunity to gain a living by work freely chosen or accepted in the labour market and a work environment that is open, inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities. We heard today from Dr Ben Gortlett, the Disability Discrimination Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission, on the importance of Article 27 and other provisions of the Convention in establishing in international law the right of people with disability to participate in the labour force. If there's one thing that emerges clearly from the evidence of the witnesses from, with disability from whom we have heard this week, it is the extremely strong, even passionate desire to obtain work and to flourish in their employment. It's hardly surprising that the witnesses emphasize the personal fulfillment to be gained from paid employment 
and the desire to make more substantial contributions to the Australian economy and society. This is, after all, what everyone expects in this country. As we heard, some people with disability have overcome all obstacles in their path and with extraordinary commitment and determination have achieved their aspirations. Others have shown the same commitment and determination, but through no fault of their own, have been unable to breach the barriers that society has placed in their path. Yet they have kept trying, often with the limitless support of their devoted and indefatigable parents. Others have succeeded in entering the labour market, but have been prevented from realising their full potential by the same barriers. Virtually all of the witnesses with disability recounted prejudicial attitudes they had experienced when seeking employment or in the workplace. They spoke of the low expectations so often held by employers of people with disability and the reluctance of employers to offer employment, allocate suitable responsibilities, or provide fair opportunities for advancement commensurate with the person's skills and experience. Dr Gauntlet today explained very clearly that it is not simply a matter of looking at what happens in a workplace, but it is also necessary to consider the many forms of disadvantage that affect employment opportunities for people with disability. He specifically identified the lack of accessible accommodation close to places of employment and accessible modes of transport suitable with the people with disability to travel to their place of employment. The evidence that we've heard of individual ex experiences of discrimination and what perhaps can be described as institutional neglect and thoughtlessness on the part of employers is just one part of the overall picture. Another part is the operation of the labour market as a whole. We learned from Professors Buchanan and Smith Merry yesterday that the pool of unemployed and underemployed people in Australia is very much greater than official figures might suggest. Similarly, it appears that the pool of unemployed and underemployed people with disability is much greater than official data records. There is an analogy to be drawn here. Over the last four or five decades, the composition of the Australian labour force has changed markedly, even dramatically. The proportion of women who are in the workforce or actively seeking employment has increased very substantially. This has been to the great benefit of the Australian economy, Australian society, and of course, women themselves. And before I am assailed by my colleagues in Brisbane and Melbourne, I recognise that there is a way to go before full gender equality is achieved. Nonetheless, I hope I'm forgiven for saying that we have made considerable progress. The experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic are likely to bring about long-term changes in work practices and perhaps in the structure of the Australian economy. The economic recovery will no doubt be strengthened by the expected arrival of an effective vaccine next year, but it still may be a protracted process. The adjustments that are likely to occur, such as greater opportunities to work remotely and to take advantage of flexible work arrangements, might well provide an opening for seeking to achieve another major change in the composition of the Australian labour force. This could be the occasion for a concerted national effort or I suppose as Professor Buchanan would prefer an effort based on cooperative federalism to harness an underutilized national asset. That asset consists of people with disability who wish to work, but who are prevented from doing so by the barriers that are placed in their path. If this can be done, the benefits to the Australian economy, Australian society and people with disability are likely to be very considerable indeed. As Ms Eastman has explained, we shall not be making findings or recommendations in any report based exclusively on the evidence of this hearing. We know that there are many complex and difficult issues that require further examination. As we heard today, we will need to look at whether changes are required to the Disability Discrimination Act or other Commonwealth legislation 
and whether there is a need uh, to move away from a complaints-based system as the mechanism for enforcing the right to work insofar as it is encompassed in anti-discrimination law. Professor McCallum, who has been present, I'm glad to say, at this hearing since last Tuesday, is conducting an important research project addressing that very question and others that bear on how right, the rights of people with disability can be more effectively enforced. We've heard evidence of the complexity of the interlocking systems of income maintenance and employment supports for people with disability and the great difficulty people with disability have in navigating those systems. We need to consider whether changes are needed to simplify the systems and to produce better outcomes for people with disability. We have heard about programs that encourage employers to engage people with disability and support them during their employment. We have heard a variety of suggestions for encouraging employers to understand better how to adapt their recruitment, training and workplace practices to provide people with disability with greater opportunities to participate in the workforce. As representatives of Get Skilled Access today told us, we need employers also to understand the benefits to them of employing and supporting people with disability. Dr Gauntlet pointed out that we have to allay the misconceptions about employing people with disability and take measures that build up trust between employers and people with disability. There is certainly no shortage of reform proposals available for consideration. We were taken to the Willing to Work report, which contains many, and many of which are not yet implemented. The statements that were admitted into evidence during the course of this week also contain numerous suggestions worthy of consideration by the Commission in its future work. As with other areas that the Royal Commission is required to investigate, improving the participation rates of people with disability in the labour market and removing discrimination could justify a separate Royal Commission. We, however, will do our best to develop proposals that will lower and perhaps in due course even eliminate the barriers that for so long have adversely affected the life prospects of people with disability. Can I conclude, please, by thanking very sincerely the Council assisting the Commission who have conducted this hearing, Ms Eastman, uh, Ms uh, Zerner and Ms Fraser, the support also that they have received from the Office of Solicitor assisting, the interpreters who uh, face uh, uh, a, an extraordinarily difficult task every time we have a hearing. There does seem to be a race among witnesses to see who can speak the fastest. They do a heroic job in coping and we're grateful to them. We are grateful to all the members of the Royal Commission staff that have handled the complex arrangements for organising this hearing, making the arrangements to allow it to take place remotely uh, insofar as necessary and generally to ensure that uh, the uh, whole process works very smoothly. People outside the Commission, I don't think, fully realise just how much work, skill and effort goes into preparing and conducting a hearing such as this. And the Commissioners are very grateful to everybody who has um, contributed. So I wish then to thank everybody who has been involved this uh, concludes this particular hearing and uh, for some of us we shall have a whole one day before the next hearing starts on Tuesday of next week and Ms Eastman will tell us the precise title of that hearing. Well, first of all, um, I'm hoping that you're going to give me oh, and yes, Ms Zerner and Ms Fraser some direction yeah, about am, what will happen forgot. next. Right. What would I do without people to remind me <laughs> about what I have to do? Um, the directions that are to be made are as follows. One, questions on notice. By Friday, 15 January 2021, any witnesses who took questions on notice during this hearing should provide their answers in writing to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission. These answers should be targeted and concise. Secondly, submissions from parties in receipt of evidence notification letters by Friday, 15 January 2021, those parties who have been notified by letter of any evidence specific to their interests 
should provide concise submissions in response, along with any additional material that is directly relevant to the evidence for the Commissioner's consideration to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission. Thirdly, Council Assisting the Royal Commission will consider any additional material produced and determine if additional steps need to be taken. By Monday 29 January 2021, Council Assisting will tender into evidence whatever additional material is considered appropriate. Fourthly, Council Assisting will pre then prepare an outline of submissions to the Royal Commission, setting out what Council Assisting proposes to deal with in oral submissions, including A, key themes emerging from and any findings available on the evidence led during the hearing, including any additional material tendered on or before 29 January 2021, and B, a proposed scope for the Royal Commission's further inquiry into the themes and issues identified in this hearing. Council Assisting's outline of submissions will be made available on a confidential basis to those parties with leave to appear at the hearing by Friday, 5 March 2021. Fifthly, parties with leave to appear who may wish to make an outline of submissions in response should do so by Friday, 19 March 2021 and finally, the Royal Commission will then schedule a one day hearing on Wednesday, 24 March 2021 for the presentation of Council Assisting's oral submissions and any oral submissions in response from the parties with leave to appear. Those directions then can be taken as having been made. Ms Eastman, perhaps you can remind us of what the hearing will be dealing with on Tuesday of next week. So that concludes public hearing nine. The Commission will resume next Tuesday in Sydney for public hearing 10. The focus of public hearing 10 is on the training of health professionals. And this is a public hearing that picks up the work that the Royal Commission uh, undertook for public hearing four, looking at health issues for people with cognitive disability at the Homebush hearing earlier this year, and also some of the work that the commissioners did uh, more recently on public hearing six in relation to psychotropic medication. It will be a two day hearing and it will be a, a hearing that will be slightly different to the hearings that the Commission has conducted to date because the witnesses will all be appearing by the audio visual links and that there'll be a series of panels. Ms Wright is appearing as junior counsel with me in that hearing and we will outline on Tuesday morning the precise mechanics and the way in which the hearing will be presented. Thank you very much and thank you again to everybody who has contributed to this hearing. Uh, the proceedings are now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. <laughs>